day two of the Croatia Rapid and Blitz, the third stop on the Grand Chess Tour. Former world champion Vishwanathan Anand and French superstar Maxime Bashir Lagrave scored big wins to move up the standings. But it was bottom seed Ivan Shadi who thrilled Croatian fans by defeating tournament leader Jan Nepomnici to stand in a tie for second place. It's the final three rounds of Rapid with six big points up for grabs. Day three of exciting action coming up next. and welcome back to lovely Zagreb for the third day of the Croatian Rapid and Blitz. We're in one of the lovely parks that dot this amazing city. And the players often come here to rest, relax, and recharge their batteries before they go and do battle. Well, there'll be no relaxation at the chessboard as there are six critical points up for grabs. And to call all that action, we're gonna jump to the studio in St. Louis with Yasser and Christian. Welcome back, everybody, to vibrant Zagreb, Croatia, the host of the third leg of the 2021 Grand Chess Tour. What a beautiful place. There's no better place to continue our summer of chess. I am Grandmaster Christian Kirilla, and I'm joined by Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan. Yasser, good morning. Good morning, Christian. As always, a pleasure to be, call the action with you and Maurice. It's been great fun, folks. Two days of truly sparkling rapid chess. And at one moment, it looked like Nepo was streaking away uh, with tournament victory until local hero Ivan Saric defeated him in the sixth round, making our standings a little bit closer. Christian. Let's look at the standings, Yasser. We have Jan Nepomniashi, the cha World Championship challenger, leading with eight points. Maxim Vashir Lagrav, Kasparov slash Saric. Saric, in this case, Kasparov is going to suit up tomorrow with seven points. Vishwanathan Anand, also seven points. Anish Giri, Jan Kristoff Duda with six points, sharing the fifth position. Alexander Grishchuk, Shakri Armamediarov, and Anton Korobov sharing the seventh position with five points. And in 10th position, Jordan Van Forest, who is still looking for that elusive first victory. And our tournament format, Christian. For the first three days, this is the last day of rapid game in 25 minutes with a 10 second increment. Starting tomorrow, we're going to uh, play blitz games in five minutes with a two second increment. There's absolutely no draw offers in this tournament. In the rapid format, for a win, you get two points. For a draw, you get one point. And for a loss, you don't get any points. Those rapid games are extremely valuable. In the blitz section, we have a win. For a win, you get one point. For a draw, you get half a point. And for a loss, you don't get any points. That's the standard scoring system. And we have a very handsome price fund of $150,000. Let's take a look at the schedule. Today is the third and final day of Rapid Chess. Again, three games, but six points up for grabs the weekend. Now it gets fun. We're talking nine rounds of Blitz, and Gary Kasparov is going to join the action for day four and five. So whatever your weekend plans were, folks, put them on hold and come and check out Gary. What an amazing day full of chess we have. But we also have one of our good friends, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley in Zagreb. Thank you, Christian. Well, it is another hot day here in Zagreb. The temperatures topping over 90 degrees. And the players are also hot on the board. They've got to bring their A game if they're going to have a chance to win this event. And it's important to note this third day, middle day of Rapid and Blitz, is usually the most crucial of all of them. Why is that? Because the winner of the Rapid almost always wins the event. Despite 18 points to come in the Blitz games, history says you had better win the Rapid. And let's take a look. We're going to go back 
to 2018, the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. My Majira but Nakamura tied after the Rapid. They chased each other down all the way to the end in the Blitz, but Nakamura was able to win the event. At Tata Steel, Magnus put up a big score, 15 points. He went on to win that in 2019. In the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, LeVon was able to win the Rapid, had trouble in the Blitz, but definitely took home the title. And the story continues. MVL won the Rapid event in Paris, had a horrible time at Bullets, and still managed to win. And in Cote d'Ivoire, Magnus was able to win after winning the Rapid, again, a big 15 points, and ran away with the event. And of course, who can forget this year, 2021 in Paris, Wesley So won the Rapid and went on to win the event. You see a trend? You betcha. However, it was not perfectly the case that you win the Rapid and you win the Blitz, there is an off chance as Korobov, who's playing in this event, Anton Korobov, won the Superbet Rapid and Blitz in Bucharest, but failed badly. He won the Rapid, failed badly in the Blitz, and Sergei Karyakin and Levon ended up tying for first. Actually, Levon won the playoffs and won the entire event. So it can be done, guys. It's possible, but you had better get a great score in rapid as you see the past winners of rapid go on to win the event we'll see who wins today and will be in pole position to take home the title guys thank you maurice absolutely insightful uh winning the rapid often is a springboard to a tournament victory but <laughs> a lot of things can go wrong. Let's take a look at our pairings for today, Christian. Set the table for us for the, round seven. The tournament is so close and we have some hot matchups for you in round seven. Grishchuk is going to be facing Anton Korobov. Duda is going to be facing Anand. That is a clash of generations right there. Ivan Saric is playing against Shakriar Mamediarov. Anish Giri is playing the leader, Jan Nepomniashi. And Jordan Van Forest is going to try to find that victory against Maxim Vashir Lagraf. And let's take a look at Nepo's a day ahead. As you just mentioned, he's facing Geary in round seven. But opportunity knocks in round eight, but he'll be having black against MVL in the last round of today, round nine. Quite a tough uh, road ahead, I would say, for uh, Jan, especially those games with the black pieces. There are no easy games <laughs> on the Grand Chess Tour. And what are the players uh, fighting for? Well, first of all, a lot of money, $150,000 in prizes, $37,500 to the winner, second prize, $25,000, but it's also about the Grand Chess Tour points. 12 points, if you tie for first, you get a bonus point of 13 points, Grand Chess Tour points, if you win it outright. And why are those Grand Chess Tour points so important? Because at the end of the tour, after the fifth event, the tournament winner, the Grand Chess Tour leader, gets a $100,000 bonus. Yes, what an amazing prize fund. And look who's there. That is Vishwanathan Anand, who is going to be facing uh, Duda in the first round. He looks confident. He does, and he's, he's played well. Uh, most especially the game that really stood out for me, Christian, was a defensive gem against Sh Shakriar Mamadarov. Shaq takes down people, and his attacking style has just destroyed world-class grandmasters. Uh, in, in, for Vichy, he took the, the sacrifice, he took more, he took more, and he withstood the onslaught. It was a very impressive defensive uh, performance. But let's jump to Zagreb and get some further thoughts and insights from Maurice. Guys, for me, looking at this event, it's been an extraordinary event. It looked like Nepo was going to run away with it, but that win yesterday by Shadich has just upended everything. And I think that players might have stepped back and thought, Nepo's just going to win. I mean, this is his event. He's just rolling along, playing brilliant chess. Now that he's lost, even the players at 50% are going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We can get new life right now with this guy that close to everyone else. So expect somebody else, maybe not in the top four, where we see Nepo at first, and we've got our three players, MVL, Anand, and Shadich, tied. 
expect somebody else to want to make a push to join that group. But the biggest story, without any question, is Sharich's performance so far. That's the whole event as far as I'm concerned. Can he maintain this incredible pace? Because if he does, we know Gary's coming in and you know Gary is watching. So let's keep our eye on him as much as possible during these next three rounds. Absolutely, Maurice. Uh, very nice insights to be sure. And for Ivan Saric to do what he's doing, Christian, in front of your home homeboys in Zagreb, the Croatian uh, it, best player, it, it's great. It's a great feeling. It's just so amazing. And I have to say, uh, I did see that in all of our stops so far. The local players were just extra motivated to play incredible chess, and they all achieved just just that. In Bucharest, we had Bogdan Dev, the 19-year-old exactly. prodigy, who played uh, incredible chess. He scored minus one, but he beat MVL in the process. He only lost two games, and he faced in classical chess the best chess players. But the games are underway, Yasser. Let's Absolutely. see what we have. Uh, there we have, uh, we're seeing the back of MVL. And here is our tournament leader, by the way, sporting uh, very, very colorful attire. I just want to put it like that. Uh, and Nepo's looking good, and both players are playing rather quickly in a Catalan. Is that surprising uh, for you to see that three piece uh, combo, especially in Rapid and uh, Blitz? Oh, most especially. Uh, I always prided myself on Blitz chess. I, I really enjoyed playing Blitz throughout my entire career. And whenever I was playing Blitz, I really wanted to play with loose clothing. T-shirt, yeah. I mean, I didn't want anything impeding me. Now again, they are playing rapid, but uh, still a long sleeve shirt, and you get into some time trouble, you're on increment, it's not that easy. And let's just take a look at the lifetime score between these two gladiators in their head-to-head -head in rapid. Woo, 14 wins. 20 losses, 36 draws. Are you kidding me? These guys have been playing a lot with one another, Christian. Nepo is definitely enjoying that matchup with 20 uh, wins against 14 losses. That's a pretty good score for Nepo, that's for sure. But they've been playing so many games, 36 exactly. draws. Are you kidding? Wow. That's amazing. And, you know, to beat Anish Gary that often, Anish uh, is considered uh, by just about everybody is one of the most solid, if not the most solid, uh, top uh, elite player on the tour. I mean, he doesn't lose that often, 20 and losses. By the way, they're playing very quickly. This they're move playing H7, H6. A variation it's a little bit of a new wrinkle for me. Of a Catalan, that it right. seems like Anish is very much uh, uh, knowledgeable about. I oh, yes. I believe he played it in the candidates to beat the Dingley Ren almost a year ago. He played something similar, but he always comes with new ideas, exactly, new wrinkles in the position. Uh, we've seen in that particular game something along the lines of an H3 at a very later stage. We're seeing very interesting ideas from uh, Anish Giri. Jan, on the other hand, do I know him as a big Catalan player or does he usually mm, try to no. avoid that? Uh, I really don't uh, think of uh, Jan. Uh, as a black side of a uh, Catalan because uh, the Grunfeld exactly. is such a dominant exactly. part of his repertoire. Uh, on the other hand, you're absolutely right what you're saying there about Anish. For me, Anish, in uh, the footsteps of Vladimir Kramnik, Vladimir Kramnik played the Catalan, and it was like, you know, you would play these defenses that everybody said, yeah, this is the right defense. And then Vladimir would come up with a new idea that nobody had previously played and he would win. And Anish for me is one of those players that finds something in the position and it's so difficult to do. Um, and here he's, well, he's in his, uh, uh, I wanna say comfort zone. Let's just take a, a whoa, what have I got here? I was gonna take a, a walk around the stage and I've got the game of, of MVL and Van Forest, and is this the Dragondorf? <laughs> it looks like a very strange mix of opening of defenses by black. It's a open well, Sicilian. Let's, let's see how white started because that's yeah. very interesting as well. Open Sicilian 
with the knight or of a7, a6, and exactly in this position, just practically every move can, has been tried. h3, rook g1, bishop g5, bishop e3, bishop c4, you name it. If it looks reasonable, it's been tried, including Michael Tall's very favorite uh, f2, f4, knight b3. And I think even Magnus tried a2, a3 in that exact position. Knight and b3 actually, is... Jordan came uh, with a very interesting idea, bishop d2. Recently, in Tata Steel, if I'm not mistaken. And then his brother, Lucas, Lucas Forrest, played yes. the same thing with Bishop D2, which is not supposed to be a very good move. In this point, Bishop D2, it, it looks pretty stupid, which kind of is. You know, why would you put this bishop here in front of the queen, defending what? A defended knight? It doesn't make too much sense. But everything has, try it has been tried against the knight dwarf and nothing just obtains the advantage. Nevertheless, you want to surprise your opponent. Is just like the Grunfeld. You know that you're probably objectively not going to get an advantage, but you have so many ways in which you can confuse your opponent that you cannot have a sitting repertoire against mm. uh, these uh, big openings. You have to always vary your responses. And this is what we're seeing from Jordan. We're seeing this move knight to b3 getting the knight out of the d4 square and preparing this defense, defensive stance on the queen side. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, h2, h3, uh, that for me is a show that he's ready to play g2, g4 against castles. But let's just take a quick look at uh, MVL's road ahead. Again, MVL comes into this event as the number one seed. Uh, he, he He's at... Seven points, okay, he's, he's in the mix and he's really setting himself up for what he hopes will be a great blitz finish. What a road ahead, by the way. Uh, Jordan in this round seven game, Anton, round eight, and the big dog clash for the ninth and final round. You're not gonna wanna miss that. Hang around for the game with Nepo. After H2, H3, uh, Black was no longer interested in castling uh, short. The moment you castle short, well, you can just bet your top dollar that g2, g4 is going to come as you would in a dragon trying to open up the king side. Nope, Black is going to leave his king in the center, complete his queen side development. And Jordan said, I'm not having that. I'm going to, I'm not going to let you just put your bishop on b7, play rook c8, and everything nice, nice. I'm gonna force the action. a4, b4, knight a2, give me the pawn. I will uh, retain the pawn with the move a5, c2, c3. I've noticed in a lot of knight or in open Sicilians, when white can win control of the b5 square, that is to say, provoking the move a6, a5, uh, if nothing untoward happens, Usually it works out very well for white. In this case, you can see that this knight could come to b5, this rook could slide to the c file, something could go wrong on the c7 square, a5 also potentially weak. Now at last, castles, bishop b5, bishop b7, castles, caught up with the players. I have the feeling it's still we're still in the throes of theory, Christian, but I don't know. Likely not at this point, but we see once again this change of pace. Normally you would expect white to castle on the queen side and try to attack on the king side with h3 or h4, g4, and then open the position on that side. But Jordan decided with this move a4, as you were mentioning, to take a much more strategic approach and try to play around the squares that you mm. were highlighting on the queen side, especially that square b5 and that pawn on a5 in any end game. Watch out for that because that one is going to fall first. Exactly. Well, rook c1 has just been played. I can easily imagine this knight on c3. It needs to jump. If it jumps to b, d5, well, um, that can be captured. Uh, I, I really want to open up uh, the pawn on a5 for attack. But uh, let's take a look at uh, Sasha Grisha's game. Uh, do you have it on your board, by and the way? And just uh, one thing to mention about yes. this game. It was indeed at this point that h3, Jordan's move, is a novelty. So uh, before, that's yes. what I thought. Oh. before that, bishop e2 was the move played, b5, and then a4. So we have a 
slightly different position. This bishop already moved to e2, so it lost a tempi. We've seen that bishop already jump all the way to b5 in one move in the game of uh, Jordan. So maybe this was his preparation. And this pawn on h3, after the move h3, you could potentially tie this pawn on h3 with an advance with the pawn to f4, because now this knight is never going to be able to jump to g4. Of course, you have to be very careful, because moving the pawn to f4 also allows a lot of pressure in the center and opens up the position of uh, this b7 bishop. So you do have to be quite careful about that f4. But you have options with this move h3. This is a slight nuance of the previous game compared to the previous game. Right. Uh, I'm just taking a quick gander at the game of Alexander Grishuk. It was a Moran variation with b5, bishop uh, d3, bishop b7. Very, very popular, especially in the 1990s uh, in the candidates that I played in in Montpellier in 1985. Uh, it was all the rage uh, and a lot of debate exactly in this position whether you should be playing a7, a6. Uh, followed by c6, c5, or bishop b7, followed by b4, and then c5. Um, <laughs> I, I, all I can say is uh, I spent far too much time trying to answer that question myself. The a6, e4, c5, e5, knight d5. I looked at this position ages ago, so I haven't seen it with the latest and greatest supercomputers, but knight g5 uh, is an attempt to absolutely destroy the line as what black is facing is the threat of knight takes e6. Uh, for example, let me play a very bad move. Knight takes e6 is the big threat. And after takes, queen h5 check. Oops. Uh, and the game is suddenly over as bishop g5 comes uh, with force. So that is why we saw the move bishop e7. And what the idea behind bishop e7, obviously, is that knight takes e6, f takes e6. Now you've just given your king a square, so after queen h5 check is not as decisive. Also, you're making a direct threat against the knight. And after bishop e7? You have to really? be very careful because uh, you, you have just to went into both a think? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I thought he would just follow it up instantly with, okay, and he this should. is. He should. He this should was be. my plan. This game was already played uh, three times before. And this I was, line. Uh, this yeah. line. I was looking through the death base. And of and course, you have to find a way to defend both the knight and the pawn, right? Because right. this pawn, if you lose it, then it's not that you lose the pawn, but if your knight is not defending that e5 pawn, you're also going to lose the e5 pawn. Also, right. This knight potentially will have a very nice landing square, very close to the center on c5, very active square. So <clears throat> this pawn on d4 is an important pawn. Queen to h5 is, is the, most natural. the move. Yes, queen to h5, you have to create your own attack on this side. And after g6, now the question arises, and are we going to play queen to g4 or queen to h6? This cool. is uh, something that... Uh, Grishchuk will have to answer. Finally, queen, queen h5 H6. is played. But queen h6 is the most Feels natural, natural move, Feels right? natural, yeah. Because you want to invade queen g7, give me the rook on h8, give me the pawn on f7. And I'm assuming that there's a long variation that goes with bishop f8. We could Christian. see some craziness ensuing something along the lines of this. Ooh. Something along the lines of this. And then maybe Whoa. even bishop takes g6, maybe queen takes e6, and bishop takes g6. There's a lot of options. Look, look at this line. You have this, this, knight takes d5. Anything can happen in this position. And to be honest, they will have to answer these questions and calculate of all these crazy variations uh, for themselves. Looks like an extra piece uh, to my eyes for black in that particular line. But let's jump to Maurice and Zagreb. Maurice, what do you have for us? Thanks, guys. I'm looking at another important game, the one with uh, the Croatian favorite, Ivan Sharic, against Shakriar Mamadirov. Remember, Shakriar has 13 grand chess tour points that puts him in a great position given that Wesley so is sitting on two events at 21.3 so Shakira needs about seven or eight points in this event to stay very competitive with Wesley and of course if he comes in second he gets 10 he overtakes Wesley winning of course he'll be in a, 
an amazing situation, not looking great for him right now. But he's playing against Sharic, who's the story of the event so far, the local boy making good. And take a look at this open Rui Lopez that they're playing after B5, Bishop to B3, D5. We got into straight main line here. And a very popular line, Knight C5, C3, D4. And it's this position that you want to look at a bit closely. Now, Shakurao is a master of the open variation. We're going to see some of the nuances that he knows. Here, Zaitsev made the move, Knight G5, extraordinary move. Uh, came up with, Tal made it famous by actually playing it in a game with this idea of queen to F3. Crazy lines. Anand and Kasparov also battled in a world championship match in this variation. But Sharic, not following Kasparov or Zaitsev, played bishop takes on e6, took on d4, played a4, and after rook b8, he played a very basic move and played knight to b3 here. Now, this challenges the knight on d4, but it's not the most active continuation. Knight to e4 on the previous move, this move was far more dynamic, putting the knight in the middle. But he wanted to challenge this knight on d4, so he played knight b3 and forced his opponent to pause. Here, Shakriya thought for over two minutes. He'd been blitzing his moves up to this point. He thought for some time and finally decided to take on b3, and now a critical moment. The active move, bishop c5, looks really great. Looks like a, a solid move to play. And after rook to d1, well, you give your queen a nice space on e7. It turns out that this move loses on the spot because of the trap bishop to g5 coming out of nowhere. Suddenly, you have no place to put the queen. f8, you can tell, just grovel city. You're going to lose that one as well to the same tactic I'm about to show you. Knight takes on g5. Why not? Well, queen takes on b5 with check, just suddenly explodes on the position. The rook is hanging on b8. You take the queen, suddenly rook to a8 with check, and that's going to be all she wrote. You throw your own queen in the way, and then it's collection time along the back rank. Shakriar avoided this move after queen takes b3. He said, uh-uh, I'm not putting my bishop on c5. Bishop to e7, rook to d1 was played, and now very smartly in this position, queen to c8. Eight played in the game. Uh, actually, let me just come back here. 60, this is correct. And I'm going to refresh to make sure I have the right moves as I was analyzing the variation. Actually, he did not play rook d1. He played queen to c2. If rook to d1, he was going to put his queen on c8. That was the trick. He played bishop e3 and then queen to c2 after castles. I'll show you what I mean here. He played bishop to e3. Now, rook to d1 looks very natural, but the queen was planned to go here. This would have been very solid for Mamadirov, despite the fact it looks like the queen is misplaced, he understood this position was fine for him, as did Sarich. So he played instead after bishop e7, bishop to e3, castles, queen c2, c5, and now a rook to a7. Again, avoiding the rook d1 move. It looks like a free move with tempo, but these guys know the ins and outs of these positions so well. Looks like an even position, basically. Both players showing excellent understanding of the open Spanish in this game, guys. Thank you, Maurice. That move, queen takes b5, that would have been a spectacular move. Uh, you know, Christian, when your opponent plays a move like queen takes b5, not only are you losing the game, but you're being immortalized. Exactly. I mean, there's exactly. going to be books written about this move forever. And you you're have like, to accept no, your no, fate. No, 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 at I don't want to. At that point, you have to accept your fate. And if it's uh, leading to a checkmate, just allow your opponent to give the checkmate. If it's leading to like a, a completely winning position, then that's a problem. <laughs> because you still have to suffer for another 10, 20 moves, right? Ooh. Or more. But uh, if it leads to a checkmate, I've seen players of the highest caliber just allow their opponents to give the checkmate and be like, look, you got it. This, is, this belongs to the history books. But That's one very game... very supportive. Uh, very sportive. I, uh, you, you don't. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big fan. But uh, how's Grisha doing? He went queen h5, queen h6. I think this one is going to end up in a very quick perpetual, actually. And let me show you why. Okay. So it did uh, go into this game with queen to h6. Bishop to f8 is a huge blunder, in fact, because after bishop to f8, we were mentioning queen to h3. That's not the move. You have to take immediately on e6, because ah. right now, um, after bishop takes h6, you can take on d8, and there's a lot of pieces Hanging, hanging in the air, and at the end, I will just simply be a pawn up, okay. even more probably. So you can take on c1, but now I take on b7. Now your knight is hanging, you have 
to exchange this guy. Now your bishop is hanging and my knight is going to escape when you retreat with the bishop. At the end of the whole variation, I'm going to be at least a pawn up. So after knight e6, black is in big trouble. Instead of bishop f8, I was looking at knight takes c3, b takes c3, which was played in the game. And in the game, uh, c takes d4 was played. Knight takes c5 was another opportunity, but Unfortunately, knight takes c5 is actually not a very good move because you have this very beautiful intermezzo with the move bishop to e4 attacking the bishop. And after this exchange, after knight to g4, queen drops back to f4, a very calm position. Now, uh, pawn up for black, but the dark squares are so weak that white has tremendous compensation in this position. It's not wow. looking very good for black. For example, after knight to e5, now I have to find a way to force you to uh, go short castle so that I can take advantage of the weakness of the dark squares. And I'm going to do that by playing the move queen to e5. That pins the knight to the rook and you have to short castle. That's going to open up the opportunity for my bishop to come to h6 with tempo. White is looking very good in this position, but it seems like Anton definitely knew about this wrinkle in the position and he took on d4 first. Now, if you take on d4, Knight takes e5 is going to come and this d4 pawn will no longer have somebody to protect him. So unfortunately, it's not looking like bishop e4 works anymore because I can just simply take, take, and queen takes d4. I don't have to move the knight away. This is a very good position for black. But instead of that, I have a feeling we're going to see this his sacrifice, knight takes g6, which is going to simply force a repetition after f takes, g, f takes e6, bishop takes g6, take, take, king to f8, bishop to h6, check. I still have one defender left to mm -hmm. sacrifice. Rook takes h6, queen takes h6, and now we're just going to see a perpetual. Wherever you go, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to find the check with the queen. And uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to have too much of a history in this game. I feel that uh, that whole line that you just showed, it just it goes down such a, a clear pathway that it's something that's been played before. In fact, that uh, there might even be it has a not theoretical, no it has because not it, just, it has not been played before. No. It just feels like it's 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 so consequent. By the way, Sasha has been as usual in the tank, and he's been thinking for some time after c5 takes d4. But I, I hear you. You just in the position that you showed, uh, Christian. After c5 takes d4, mm -hmm. uh, c3 takes d4. Uh, pardon me. Knight takes e6. Knight takes e6 first yeah. without. Yeah. And then very quickly after f takes e6, you showed bishop g6 and. You well, this took was it. not the position. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. This yeah. was the position. Uh, yes. And then you took on g6 very quickly. Why didn't you take the rook? Well, you can take the rook, but the problem is I will just simply defend with a move knight to f8. I'm going yeah. to have a very compact defense with these two pieces, and I just have a, a, a material advantage. Okay. Uh, let's jump to Zagreb uh, with Maurice. Thanks, guys. A quick report on the Sharish Bamadirov game. Looks like it's going towards a repetition quite quickly as we saw this position before rook to a7 landed and now the problem of rook d1 is going to be very uncomfortable for the black queen so Shakira played rook a8 Sharich insisted with the move rook to b7 hitting the pawn and remember again rook to d1 coming will force the queen to go to e8 to have to defend that bishop and maybe even there'll be a doubling of rooks on the seventh rank he played rook b8 rook to a7 back Rook to A8 back by Shakriar, and we're getting a repetition right now. No reason for Sharich to play for a win in this situation, especially with those two pawns. Black is trying to get that majority going on the queen side. On the other hand, when we think about Shakriar's situation, he needs to get points, but he may be careful here. He's like, I got the black pieces against a player who's hot in this event. Let me be very careful and take my chances later. Sharich gets the OG gangsters today. He gets Shakriar in this round. He gets Anan in the next round and then Grishchuk in the final round. And don't forget that he will exit the event today. He'll be headed to Sochi, Russia to play in the World Cup. He would feel really great if he came out today 
breaking even just 50% would be fabulous for him as he would give that score to one Gary Kasparov tomorrow. So a repetition here, maybe the fans want to see him win, but being smart, a draw against these kind of players and the result he would have would just be a fantastic result. Guys? Gary Kasparov would definitely be doing back flips to be sure and it does look like this repetition is occurring and the game will shortly be drawn all right as you were saying um uh, maurice definitely Shaq needs to get on some kind of streak but what murderers row Ivan has facing i wanted to just turn our attention to our tournament leader uh nepo's game he's playing against anish giri in uh, Catalan, when we left the game, we had just seen the move knight a6. Black had carved out the b4 square for a knight. Knight looks very uh, well on the b4 square. But after e4, white is getting uh, play in the center. And h4, queen b8, e5. Uh, the players have been, very, been playing very quickly to a certain moment when everything kind of stopped. After the move rook to d8, uh, obviously, the battle is all about the d5 square and who is going to control it best. Well, now or never, said Anish. I'm going to play the move d5, and the players have very quickly reached this position on the board. And normally speaking, in these imbalances of knight versus bishop, it's really about where the knight is standing. Uh, put the knight on a very nice square, a protected square, anchor square like d6, or in this case f5, and I really like white's position. With the knight sitting still in the hospital on e1, I'm not a big fan. I think that black will walk away from the opening saying, I'm doing fine. Uh, Christian, your thoughts? I think black is doing just fine in that position, and I just want to take it down, uh, take it back a few moves sure. just to kind of explain why we've seen uh, this move e5 then clarification in the center by white. And that is because of this move, queen to b8, very, very active move, despite the fact that it looks like it's not going anywhere. I'm actually preparing the move b6 and the battery with queen to b7 and that's going to be bad news if i manage to connect the queen and the bishop on that diagonal that's going to be bad news for white so this is exactly the reason why anish immediately clarifies the position with e5 bishop to e7 i have to get rid of that bishop because if you're going to be able to uh, secure this outpost on a d5 black's position is just going to be strategically dominant and after bishop to rook d8, d5, take, 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 exchange everything, we have this position. Bishop against knight, I don't see a white's advantage at all, to be honest. If anybody, it would be black who has the advantage in this position. Thank you, Christian, for that. Let's just turn our attention back to a game we started with, Jordan Van Forest versus MVL. Uh, when we left it, both players had castled uh, short in this Najdorf, Dragondorf, uh, castles long by white, but the uh, with the queen and we are opening. having a result. Just uh, sorry uh -huh. to cut you about that. Grischuk and Korobov have agreed to, to a, a draw. draw. Perpetual check. Exactly the perpetual check, check that, that we were showed. looking at. All right. Um, when we left it, uh, Rook C1 was played by Jordan, and for the moment, there's only one target in Black's position, and that's the pawn on A5. If I'm Black, I'm, I'm going to be trying to use my majority in the center, something like the move Rook D8 and D5, uh, maybe uh, with the preparatory E7, E6 as well. Uh, the, Line continued, rook d8, as you would expect. And then this <laughs> highly perplexing move, rook d8 to c8. Wow. Uh, I saw that and I had just said, okay, sometimes uh, chess is a mystery, even for the top grandmasters. Rook d8, queen b8, rook c8. Yeah, I know. It looks very, very surprising. And then after knight d2, again, it's all about the queen, uh, pardon me, the pawn on a5. By the way, the noise that you're hearing in the background is here at the St. Louis Chess Club, we're doing this incredible renovation. In fact, we're taking over the entire building. This is going to be the most premier club in the United States by far, and maybe, maybe even the world. It's going to look great, but what a time to start drilling. <laughs> uh, 
Christian, you also had the same the, the, the game in front of you as well. Uh, after rook takes, queen d8 to defend the pawn on a5, knight d4. Looks like Jordan has got a tiny something something. Uh, knight e5, queen d2 to e1. He but wants to play bishop d2. Did he miss the move knight to d3? Not, pardon me? Did he miss the move knight to d3? After, ah, you're uh, ahead of me. takes d5. Takes, yes, takes. we have e takes d5 and knight d3 on the board right now. And this seems to be Whoa. the equalizing blow for uh, black because this will allow me to simplify the position after bishop takes d3, bishop takes d4, I move my king away. I can even start with knight to c5 before taking this pawn on b2 just to find another active uh, move with tempo. Also, you will have to potentially defend this pawn on d5, either with bishop c4 or with bishop e4, or you can go bishop to uh, b5. This is uh, another decision that Jordan will have to make, but playing bishop to b5, allowing me to capture this central pawn and potentially expand in the center via the move e5 in the future with a strong bishop on b4, this could spell bad news for white. So at this point, maybe he will go bishop to c4, then we will have to wait and see either bishop uh, takes b2 or rook takes b2. This pawn on a4 is weak. I do have the bishop pair as white, so uh, there's still some compensation for, let's say, the structural damage that black did in the position. Uh, but I have to say, in this situation, with the current time on the clock, I'm starting to prefer MVL already. Uh, my spidey sense was tingling in that variation you were showing after knight c5. Uh, so bishop takes... Oop. I think he played the move knight to he c6. He did play knight to c6. Sorry, just to go back, just a quick second to the variation you were yes. showing. Because, uh, yeah, uh, there was a pawn hanging on a5. Queen takes a5. Knight b3, I've got a uh, check on the back rank, so you're not forking. And, well, yes. I, I mean, very, very double-edged. Very uh, double-edged, yes. I can play the move e5 and try to uh, find open immediate counterplay with e4. If I manage to get this knight into uh, play, swarming around the g3 and f2 squares, then obviously you're in trouble. But it is a pawn up, it is the two bishops, but your king is weak. Yeah. Nevertheless, we, we saw the move knight c6. Knight c6 and uh, the queen, queen on b6 d8 and is bishop hanging. B3. So the queen uh, went to b6, check. Now white's queen is hanging, so white had to play the move bishop e3. Uh, everything's hanging. I'm, I'm not sure what the material count is after all of this, but check that move out. Queen takes b5. That's a visual. So his Probably idea. we're going to see a takes b5, a takes or b5. knight takes c7 first, but I think he's going yeah, to start with a takes b5. On e1, rook takes e1. Now this guy is hanging, this guy is hanging. I'm boldly pointing out the obvious of how many pawns mm -hmm. are hanging in the position. I mean, I've spent my whole career, you know, like counting the pawns, but rook takes b5, knight takes e7 is with a check, but b2, d5 is hanging, knight takes king. Whose pawn is more dangerous? I would say the a pawn. Uh, if if you had, if if I saw this position, you said, "What opening did it come from?" I said, "Oh, it's a Grunfeld." I mean, it's absolutely a, 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 a stone cold Grunfeld. Open Sicilian uh, <laughs> would would have surprised me. Would probably be uh, among the last on my list. Exactly. Uh, but Queen openings. takes B five is on the board, I believe. Queen takes uh, B five is on the board. Yes. Right. Queen takes b5, and right now Jordan is thinking, but yes. I no think choice. A takes b5. We're going b5. to see something along the lines of this, this, this. And Knight let's takes jump to a game. Uh, let's uh, jump instead to uh, Maurice and Zagreb. Maurice. Thanks, Yasser. A surprising development in the game with Duda and Anan. You no, know, Anan is currently tied for second. The Tiger from Madras is showing that he still has very sharp teeth. And he played this tactical idea. Uh, they got to this position here. Rook fe1, and Anand spotted a tactic, and he played it b5. Now, b5 is such a great move. If you decide you're going to double capture on the b5 square, oh, look at that, I want a pawn. Well, whoops, a tactical shot with this discovery, and white's queen is under attack. 
you take this piece, then this bishop is hanging on b5. And of course, if you take the queen, then white will lose his queen in that line. So the, right here after, after b5, this very nice move, bishop to b3 was played. And now with this position intact, with this pawn on b5, this bishop on a3 out of play, it seems like the pawn on d3 is the one that you should target. And this move, rook to d8, seemed like the most natural move. Like you get a chance to swing your rook over onto an open line. Seems pretty natural in this position. White could continue with knight e4, but nevertheless, it seemed like the best way to play. Instead, Vichy played the somewhat cryptic rook a to b8. Again, after b5, bishop b3. Rook a to b8, putting it on a closed line, if white capture is here at any point, then you're going to take back with the pawn anyway. You wonder, what's the rook doing on b8? Why does it have to be here in this position? h3 was played. h6. Rook to e3. Rook f to e8. And again, I'm looking at a rook in b8 and wondering, why there? It seemed very odd to follow b5 with putting your rook on this line. Uh, he must have some reason why he felt that was best, but the game's proceeding apace. And now we see the move knight to e4 being played in the position. We'll keep an eye on this one. But guys, I have to say, the very aggressive b5 followed by the very passive rook to b8 seemed like mm, a, a bit of a, a, a soft one for me as far mm. as Anand is concerned. Uh, nice mixture there of passive-aggressive, so to speak. Uh, but let's take a look at Vichy's road ahead. Uh, for today, uh, as he, of course, is playing Duda in round seven. He goes on to play Ivan Saric, a player is playing very well, or rather to say the two players sharing second, go head to head with one another, and he finishes the rapid with Anish Giri. So difficult uh, road ahead for him as well. I'd like to turn our attention back to the game of Jordan Van Forest and MVL for a moment, because in, in my view, Jordan made a very important intermezzo. Those intermezzos are the difference yes, uh, of the yes, time sir. between wins and losses. He's in yes. trouble. He's in trouble. Jordan is in trouble. He just blundered uh -oh. big right now because Black has the move A3 on the board possible, Ooh. which was played. You cannot take because I'm going to pin that bishop and you're uh -oh. going to lose it. Uh oh. What uh -oh. just happened? Oh my goodness. Uh, that is a that is a big blunder by Jordan. He, he missed oh the combination goodness. of rook b1 and bishop c3. I just wanted to say that going back to the position we saw after queen takes b5, this, in my view, was a very important in, intermezzo uh, by Jordan. He took first on e7 check uh, because if you trade the queens, king f8 is possible. In this case, king f8 is not possible. King f8 would, be, in fact, be a terrible blunder because of check and you're walking into a checkmate either with double check with either bishop c5 or bishop g5 and black is toast. So after check, king h7, we quickly come to a position where white is a pawn up, but he's forced to play this retreating move bishop c1 and after a4, rook e4, Jordan simply overestimated his position. This was a, a a mistake and a3 and you were saying Christian it's really bad news bishop c3 absolutely and that's what he missed the move bishop to c3 because let's fast forward a few moves here of course the main move that you're thinking about is either bishop to h6 or bishop, bishop to b2 to, to attack directly the bishop on c1 the problem with those moves is that White can just simply play the move bishop to d2, and this is why Jordan was playing so fast, because the rook is on a dark square, so my bishop will be able to defend it via bishop to d2, mm. either against bishop h6 or against bishop to b2. But I want what I want to do first with the black pieces is firstly relocate your rook from a dark square to a light square, because after rook to d1, I have this move bishop to b2. I do not have the check because that rook would take the bishop, but I do have the move bishop to b2. And there's absolutely no way. This is a very standard way of winning this piece on this uh, pin. Mm -hmm. And after rook to f1, well, the king is defending the rook. You cannot play bishop to b2 or bishop to d2 because I'm just simply going to capture that bishop and the rook is going to be protected. But firstly, check. 
I'm going to give you a check. I'm going to force the king away from the defense of the rook and put it on h2 or h1. He decided to go on h2 and after I do... Oh, he played bishop to c5? Wait yeah, a It's minute. a tickle on the knight. Wait, ah, he uh, wants to it, take another uh, pawn. Yeah, he didn't want to play bishop wow. b2 or bishop b2. And That's after, devious. I That's know, devious. isn't that just cruel? Uh, if he had played bishop b2, uh, I'll put it on your board, Christian, if you don't mind. Bishop b2, I bishop think a lot of us would have said, oh, I'm very happy to win an exchange. No, no, no. These guys want the maximum. Everything. 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 Bishop, bishop c5, tempo oh, against the so knight, nice. and then he wants to play bishop takes a3, winning the exchange while capturing a pawn. Another pawn as well. Nice. Nice. That's why you don't get in tactical melees with uh, MVL. He's going to outcalculate you every single time. I know he's uh, so good, mar marvelously uh, gifted uh, calculator as our number one seed is showing. Why, in this game at least, why he came into the, into this event as the number one seed? Let me just take a look at, at that game of Vichy Anand uh, that Maurice was mentioning because a lot of captures happened. After rook e3, knight e4 was essayed by Duda. And that move, gosh, you see this rook on e3 and you just think, oh, rook a e1 was automatic. That was what um, White's intentions were. I was wrong. Knight e4, trade, trade, bishop e6. Bishop, what? Bishop b3? Oh, pardon me, there was a bishop on, <laughs> trading bishops. There was a bishop on b3. Uh, trade, trade, and the players have reached this position. Um, knowing Vichy as I do, uh, that he's an open Rui Lopez player, he's used to having a pawn on b5, I think he's going to be okay with this ending position. And I, uh, yes, I think please. I'm starting to understand this move, a rook a to b8 by uh, Vichy. The and cryptic the, move. The that cryptic Maurice, move, yes, uh, yes. Called it. Well, he was looking towards the end game. And in the end game, with a rook on a b8, he's going to have the extra option of immediately uh, playing the move a5, which mm -hmm. will force a lot of simplification, a lot of uh, exchanges of the pawns on this side. And that's just going to take the game closer to uh, that equal position that Black so desires. Uh, and um, if you don't have the rook on b8, then a5 obviously is not possible because a takes b5 is going to happen. So for example, let's say if you put the rook on d8, let's make some random moves. Now you cannot play a5 because a takes b5 is just going to win Clear. two pawns. Clear. Winning for white. But with the rook on b8, what we have in the position right now, and he's not in a hurry because if White decides to take uh, and uh, release the tension with a takes b5. I'm just simply going to take back and then I'm going to be ready to challenge your rook on the a file. And I think it is black who actually has the superior firepower on the a file because the rook is already ready to go to a8. So you do not want to take on b5. You want to stay like this, but black is going to play the move a5 very, very soon. So, for example, bishop e3, a very natural developing move, running into b5, a4 takes b5, rook takes b5, if you just continue the line for just a moment. And do I have rook d5? And, and we by have the a way, draw? we do have a draw. Uh, Nepo, our tournament leader, I see that the players reached a repetition. Uh, in that ending of a Bishop and Knight. We'll come back to it for a moment, in just a moment. Uh, rook to d5? Uh, with rook the idea, uh, if you trade rooks, then the rook on a1 happens to be perfectly uh, poised to, to rook takes a5. And that is a very good move, yes, sir. And maybe a5 directly doesn't work just because of that. Well, you could just continue the Let's line see, for just rook, like rook to b8. Take a, rook to b1. Exactly. That I can was give the you move. A check. Take, take. And King then you got and rook then a1. Go behind. Wow. It's a long, long, long variation. Still bishop c5. I'm not uh, completely it, sold on this. 
Aha. Bishop to c5, rook takes a5, you can take on d6 and then take on d... You ca I cannot take on d5, unfortunately, first, because that's just going to lose a piece. And if you take, we're going to get into this position, but you still have this defense <laughs> and you keep one pawn alive. Keep, keeping it alive. You go here, I go here, I defend everything. Right. One of the things that, that Nepo came into this tournament and he said, look, I'm going to use this event as a training uh, for my world championship match with Magnus. There's no question Magnus Carlsen is one of the most gifted in-game players I've ever seen in chess. Um, and yeah, Magnus is going to try to take uh, Nepo into ending. So when he's playing black against Anish Giri in an ending, this could be just the type of training that he needs. And he played this move bishop to d6. And I wasn't a hundred percent sure that that is the maximum move. In other words, I see, of course, everybody understands that the rook is coming to c7, but in truth, I would much rather have my bishop on this long diagonal. I, I had been trying to analyze or calculate the variation after rook a6, rook c7, rook b6, in order to retain uh, putting the uh, bishop on the long diagonal. Bishop d6 was um, Nepo's choice, and this is how the players ended up getting a repetition. As we've been sh saying throughout the entire broadcast, no draw offers, but these guys are really good at discovering repetitions. How is MVL doing against Jordan with that extra exchange? Well, he's an extra exchange, and uh, it's a pretty uh, pure extra exchange because. Uh, exactly. You lost one pawn in the process, that pawn on a3, and you're about to lose another pawn, uh -oh. that pawn on d6. That doesn't sound good. Now, Jordan's uh, strategy right now has completely changed. He's going to be looking for a fortress type of defense. Mm. He's not looking for a defense related to his uh, two extra pawns. Right now, he's okay. Okay, you can take my two pawns. I'm going to try to find the fortress. I don't see it. I do not believe that this will be a fortress. I think slowly but surely Black is uh, going to simply uh, break through. Right. Uh, this move, knight. And you can see it in the body posture as well. Look at MVL. Exactly. His confidence laying back. It's just that I see this pawn on g5. I see an anchor square for the bishop. Oh, knight and to d4. Yeah, Check and what you were move. saying about uh, trying to create a, a fortress if uh, I can um, maintain my bishop on f6, I've got fortress ideas. And so it was the move knight d4 that was just played. Wait a minute. The trick here is... That's a problem. Rook takes, I've got bishop check, whoop, and white would make a draw. So after knight d4... You have to go knight b6 back. Um, rook... I don't have time for rook e1 because of... Bishop f6 check, and followed by d7. Ah, but maybe but you can what take on e7. Exactly. Knight takes e7, takes rook, knight c6. Now, fortunately for white, the king can't easily approach this knight. You're going to have to play f6. But now with material so reduced, knight and pawn versus rook Well, yes, sir. Does this remind you of something? Yeah, that was recently played, right? This, uh, there was this game. Uh, By MVL against Fabiano in the in candidates. The candidates, The critical right? eighth round uh, of the candidates. Exactly. But in that game, uh, MVL Fabi was won. defending. Yeah. So Fabi he has, won the, maybe he learned something from that end game. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did, actually. It, it was remarkable because Fabi uh, had been pre preparing for an entire year came up with the novelty of the year in the Nidorf, and somehow MVL stayed in the game, stayed in the game, till the very, very, very end, got a fortress-like position, but didn't manage to Well, to very similar it. to what we probably will get in this game, if he takes Remarkable. on Remarkable. But let's jump uh, to Zagreb and Maurice. Maurice, what do you have for us? Well, it's a situation where the chasers are going after Nepo. Nepo has drawn the game, but we know we have two big-time players behind him. MVL looking to try to press home this position uh, that starts starting to look a little difficult, but maybe still has some chances. But it is 
Vichy, the old tiger, that's showing how to get it done. And take a look at this. You may say, well, white's just perfectly fine. You want to see how to get outplayed with a few magical moves? Well, white played the move rook to d2. A little bit of a soft move looking for the a file. And Vichy said, no problem. I'm going to get active. F5. Rook d8, 2. Let me take on e4. And now knight d2 looking like you're going to get a great square e4. Well, you'll get it, but first weaken a pawn. F takes e3, knight to d5. Well, I can cover everything, right? Knight e4, guards the c3 pawn, discovers a defense on the e3 pawn, but your rook is on a2. And that nuance caused Anand to play, boom, a sacrifice on the b4 square. Give me the pawn, give me more food, as he continued now with this line. He's winning back a rook. He's going to be two pieces for a rook, but ahead of two pawns that is two pawns count them two connected pass pawns at that a big time change of events for anan in this position he's going for it is he going to win the game well it is two pieces let <laughs> be clear but he is going for it he wants to win showing that that fire is definitely in his belly and by the way he hadn't played in 16 months this guy hasn't played in this in 16 months is this what rust looks like amazing stuff Guys, great tactical awareness that Bishop takes B4 by Vichy. Don't know, though. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of the two pieces, but two pawns, that's, that, that's big. But I'm still absolutely fascinated by this knight versus rook uh, endgame, Christian. Speaking of this one, uh, yes, this is a draw. This is the a table base. Draw. No, it's not even table base. Okay, it's actually please. just a forced draw because there's no way to win this pawn without losing the pawn on g6. Uh, For example, after well, f6. He played the move f4. This I don't think is good. But let's look at what the right move would have been. He Kate. had to take on f6. Clear. And the thing is, right now you don't have enough time to get your king to e8. That is the critical square. Once you get the king to e8, yeah. you will be able to attack my knight with the move rook to e6. Why I'm saying that is, imagine white would play king to g2, not king to f2. Uh, king to e8, king to f2, now I have the move rook to e6. And that's just going to force the knight away, and I'm going to uh, take the pawn on e7, and then, I don't know, maybe it's a table-based draw, maybe not. But it's going to be a grind, and it's very likely that black is going to be able to convert, especially in a practical game. But instead of king g3, of course, I'm not going to uh, go forward. I'm going to immediately attack the rook. Now you have to right. find a place for the rook. Where are you going to go? Or if you want to stay on the e-file, the only square is e6. The problem with that is that with the king on f7, not on e8, you have the move knight to d8 and just uh, a draw. Sure. After king takes e7, king, knight takes e6, king takes e6, this is a very well-known uh, draw. But if you want to play something along the lines of rook to c1, now I have this check. That's just going to force the capture of the pawn on g6. There's no way to uh, protect against the promotion and protect the pawn on g6, king takes e7, knight takes g6, and uh, with a pawn and a knight, this we know it's a draw. Even without the pawn on f3, it is a draw. He did not see that. He played the move f3, f5, king to g3. We have this position on the board. So right now, you have potentially this uh, idea of knight takes knight e5. But the question is that if you go like this, we do have four, a few more moves. We do uh, have live. Uh, just king f7, refreshed. king f2. These are the exact moves that we have exactly. them on the board. Now the question is, how is this endgame? Well, knight e5 check has just been played. You. It has. Yes. What about rook takes e5 now? But rook takes e5 is a marvelous opportunity, I think. But you cannot take it, unfortunately, because king e3, and I'm just going to stay there. And whenever ah. you go king e6, I go king d4. But then it's then it's an easy draw because knight take. He's managed. Jordan has managed to trade off. His vulnerable e7 pawn. Is it though? For, is it that easy? Yeah, this is really easy. Knight Should e5 be, right? check and king f3. And I think the players can just shake hands. As a, yeah. That's a protected pass pawn yeah. after all on, a, on g5. Now, there is this incredibly fascinating endgame position of two minor pieces uh, versus a rook and two pawns. Uh, if between Vichy and Duda, and 
if white, white has just played the move rook c1 and he's trying to find good squares for his minor pieces, so a very tense affair. I think but that's I the one we should stay with. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that uh, while the players are playing very quickly in the rook versus knight situation, not well, that one, the other one, I meant. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Uh, what is the time? Uh, Five minutes for Jordan. Uh, it seems like three minutes for MVO. Nine, nine minutes. minutes. Okay, ton of time for uh, great blitz players like MVO. Can you get uh, the king to e4 somehow, and maybe create <laughs> some problems like that? I have Can a feeling this might actually e4? be a long defense for White, because I don't think you can stop my king from going to e4. I'm, I'm not sure. I was actually thinking that you He's could gonna go, go king, g6. Uh, I, yeah, that you could go king g3, king h4, king h5, worm your way up the the uh, h file. But he's a, yes, you're right. He was about to play g6. Maybe he's a little bit worried about rook a3 check, where his king might get cut along the uh, third rank. Here. I'm pretty sure I would probably play king g3 myself. Uh, we'll see what Jordan, he did play g6, so his king might suffer uh, and be cut after this rook check. But let's jump to Maurice and Zagreb. Maurice. A huge development in the game between Duda and Anand. Duda was trying to use his two pieces to defend against these connected pass pawns and he managed to pull an Anand on Anand, as we know. Anand it really loves the knight. It's one of his favorite, it's his favorite piece. This was put no final point on it. When he played against Gelfand in his World Championship match, anytime he could play Bishop takes knight, he played that move. Bishop takes knight. He just loves having those knights. Well, this one comes back to haunt him as king to e2, king f7, rook to c1 played, and he played the move c4, a very natural looking move, and Boom! Rook takes on c4, takes knight d6, check king e6, and knight takes back on c4, taking one of those pawns away. King d5 was played, knight b2, now e4, king d1, and maybe Anand still feels like there's some chances here, the rook and pawn versus the two minor pieces, because the other position may have been too tricky. We'll see whether or not this is an in accidental or intentional blunder. MVL told us, when he faced Rook F6 in his game, uh, I forget who he was playing, but it was yesterday's game where Rook F6 was played, skewering his Rook on F1. He said, yeah, I intentionally let that blunder happen. Uh, turns out it was intention. Was it that for Anand here trying to milk this position? We will see, but no longer two pass pawns, just one to have to deal with for the white pieces. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, there, I'm sure that move C4 showed a sign of rust uh, you don't want to give up that pawn, maybe b3 instead. And now white's pieces, especially the bishop on c3, really good square. Um, I was a little bit of surprised by this move, king e2. I think I would want to rearrange the knight somehow. I'm not exactly sure what the best square is, but somehow I would want to get the bishop to b2 and maybe the knight to d2 if it I could? It seems like this is uh, his fortress right now. He uh, committed to this one with the bishop on c3 defending the knight. That protects against uh, the knight king coming uh, either via a4, either via c4 and penetrating into the position. Right, the knight serving to uh, cover all the business squares, we yep. like to say. Yep. But also... Uh, and the king covers on the other side. Yeah, if I wanted to be aggressive, though, I could also try king d2, bishop g7, making room for the king, king um, c3. Of course, I'm going to suffer the consequences of a rook coming down to the king side with rook a1 to rook g1. This is actually a very, very tense, double-edged, uh, two minor pieces versus a rook position. It is. Um, so what I think uh, is going to happen, yes, maybe please. we can follow on uh, your board sure. answer. Uh, that rook, as you were mentioning, is going to land on c2. The bishop is going to stay somewhere on the long diagonal, trying yep. to continue defending the knight on b2. Yep. 
And at the right moment, black is going to try to bring the king via a3 because the bishop on c3 is no longer going to be able to stay there. And I'm going to go king c5, king b4, king a3, exactly as you pointed out. Uh, this feels once like... Once you get your rook to c2. Once you get the rook to c2 because you have to displace this bishop from c3. Otherwise, you cannot enter into the position. So Fair enough. This seems to be the way it's going to uh, be handled, the position by both sides. Now, white is going to have a big decision to make, as you are pointing out. Will he go bishop to g7 or bishop somewhere on the long diagonal and try to capture that uh, b3 pawn with the king, mm -hmm. but at the same time allow that rook to potentially get all the pawns on the king side? Right. They're not going to have any defender. Right now, you're defending on the queen side with your two pieces and on the king side with your king. But at some point, you're going to have to make a decision. Either you're going to uh, stay put and wait for your opponent. Either you're going to try. And there is a way, in fact, to uh, maintain equality. But we're going to speak about that in a second because we have Maurice in Zagreb with some uh, news. Not news, just a comment on this game, very quick one. The talk you're having right there, Christian, as you expostulate the various options that white has and black has and black goals uh, in the position, don't forget to look at the clock. Let's follow that carefully. The defender has to defend with under 30 seconds on the clock. In these kind of situations, in a rapid game, usually you blunder. Usually you just blunder. On on with over five minutes. Due to always ticking down now with this increment, let's pay attention because I get the feeling there's going to be a big swing just because of the time factor alone. Guys? Maurice. Uh, Completely they, agree with that, Maurice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, time, of course, makes a fool of all. Time trouble makes fools of all of us. H6, H5 by Vichy. And very quickly came the move G4 by uh, Duda. Uh, the move g4 is intended to keep this pawn on a dark square g5. He didn't want to allow Vichy to play the move g5 g4. By keeping the pawn on g5 it means that this bishop, oops, excuse me, my arrowism is eh, can't do it. Uh, the bishop uh, always has a target in the, the position with the move bishop f6. h5, h4. As expected, by the way, the game of Jordan and MVL was drawn. Um, an exchange up, I think MVL is going to rue this game thinking that, man, I just let one get away. Uh, uh, with a victory, he could have jumped in uh, a tie for first. That one player big, that can uh, jump uh, big into miss? tie for first is Vichy. So as well. Let's, uh, keep an eye on that. Exactly. So we just saw another incredible big time move by Vichy, h5, h4. And basically what Vichy is saying, I want to play rook to f8 to f3, and I want to go after this pawn. Why wouldn't you do it right now? Well, he just played h4. It's, uh, I, no, oh. h4, knight to d1. Oh, I'm sorry. Knight to knight d1, to d1 was so he's, sorry. It looks like he's trying to go well, with the knight to f2. I, I think in that case, if your rook lands on... Well, let's have a look. Why not? Rook to f8. King to e2, I think, might be the only way to protect against mm. this rook f3, rook takes h3. A, a kind of incursion, right? Uh, nothing else to do. Knight and f2. now you know what we could have. King to c4. You put the bishop somewhere. And now rook takes f2. How is that endgame? You want to king go to into D3. this king and pawn endgame. You uh -huh. cannot take the pawn on g5. I'm because going to go king B2. to c2. I'm going to go b2. And I think in any version of that endgame, the king and pawn endgame, the, the, the I'm king lost. and pawn endgame is just simply lost. Wow. Nice, nice sacrifice of the exchange. And they're and going for that, comes, by the way. It all comes with a tempo, and Vichy can feel it. He played a rook to g3. He play, yeah, which, by the way, was my first move too, right? I mean, it looks like, you know, it's a kind of one of those creepy, crawly moves where you envision, you know, like you're getting uh, into your opponent's uh, back rank. So rook g3 is instinct, but I liked 
your sacrifice very much. And I think you could have just done it right away. With I think Rook so. Rook F2 yep. and King C4, you don't even need King C4. The problem just, with King C4 is that White also has Knight takes E4. Right, which might mix things up. But the immediate Rook F2 might have just uh, won the game. But how does how did the game continue? He's trying for a Oops. different route, and that is uh, to go with the rook to b1, and that's uh, going to support that push to b2. Excuse me, I'm just going to have to refresh my board for just a moment. Bear with me, I apologize. Uh, this was the rook g3 variation, and this is... He found a way. He did find a way. He's crawling into the position, and <laughs> suddenly... Who has the more dangerous pawns? Well, as soon as I play rook takes h3, does Vichy, uh, he will have a pass pawn. But this move, knight c3 check. Wait Ooh, a minute. That, I have a that feeling move? that Vichy might have underestimated move. this move. Oh, man. This is getting uh, sharp. Double-edged, absolutely. I think from White's point of view, he's ready to sacrifice one of his minor pieces for this b pawn. Uh, provided that he can just liquidate everything on the king side. Knight c3 check. What's the time situation, uh, Christian? 30 seconds for Duda. More than five minutes for Vichy. Hold. Three and a half. Ooh, and you know, there's, there's tricky knights. I saw the move rook h3, knight g5, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, he's blundered a fork, but there is still this pawn on b3 on the board. Don't even think about capturing the rook with knight takes g5, knight takes h3. The b pawn would promote, and that's why we saw the move bishop to d4 by Duda. But this is what I was talking about. Yes, you could potentially win a bishop with the move rook check, king f3, b2. But at the end of the day, I think I get to play knight takes g5 and liquidate everything on the king side, make a draw. Oh, absolutely, and that is exactly what uh, Duda's plan is. Right. But uh, that's just a result of Black allowing that knight to get back into play. Exactly. Yeah, knight d1, knight to c3, and get active. I do believe that c3 square was somehow of an invisible square for uh, Vichy. Right. Because that bishop stayed for so long on <laughs> c3, that knight was never yeah. even approaching that square. Exactly. And now it could jump. Right. to c3 and take on uh, e4 with devastating uh, effects. And this is exactly what we're seeing. Rook h2, Maybe uh, Duda check, escape. by the way. Um, questioning, do you want to play knight f3? No. King knight f2, f2, king f3. Was played. Yeah. B2. Go ahead, uh, win my bishop if you like, b2. Big he decision takes, right now. No. Is he going to take on b2 or is yes. he going to go knight c3? He no, took. he's going to take right away. Oh, he took on g5 first with check. Those wonderful intermezzo moves that I always admire. Check. King can't go to f6, so went king d5. Now you take on b2. Bishop takes b2. Rook takes b2. And how do and I corral that pawn on uh, the h file right now? I'm question. going to play knight h3, knight f4 check, g5, and king g4. Easy peasy. He played king f4. What? King f4 he played. Wait a minute. Oh, that's okay, too. I, he's got knight f3 and g5. I thought knight h3, knight f4 check, and g5 was easier, but uh, Duda has this also in his bag of tricks. Yes, that is true. So rook to g2 right now is going to be met by king to f3 back, I'm expecting. Rook to g2. No. Because knight to f3, I simply go h3. And I think he played rook to g2. I think we're going to see king to f3. No, we did not see uh, king to f3. No, he didn't. He, he played e4 check. e4, okay. Let's stay with this, e4 uh, check. With this board right now. Uh, king to d6 on the board. So he does have e5 check as well. But it's funny, I, I didn't think that uh, it was necessary to involve... King to f5. Whoa! completely different way of defending the position. Talk about aggressive defense. King, I'm not a big fan of this. I think it's still okay. But you have but to go back. skirting on the edge. No, you got e5. You got e5 to keep the black king uh, on rook to g3. Then you're right, I would have to go back. 
Whoa. Uh, Wait a minute. So a very strange G3, way of, of, of playing for a draw as well. Yeah, so rook to g3, you go back, and then I cut you on the third rank. I go rook to a3. How do right. you uh, keep my pawn in check? Exactly. So you go rook g3, I go king f4, you go rook across. Yes. Then I go knight f3, you go, now I go h3. h3, and I go g5 with the idea of king to g4 and knight to h2. But it's just holding barely. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I Why mean I'm on, you know, like <laughs> I'm tingling. I'm not really a big fan of Duda's uh, method of defense, but I think it's still okay. And what about Vichy? Does Vichy is Vichy ready to, to play Rook G3? Vichy and H3? under two minutes right now. A minute and thirty seconds. Thirty nine seconds. Duda still with 18 seconds on the clock. 18 seconds, playing 18 on his seconds. increment. Just to remind everybody, you get a 10 second bonus for each move you make and complete. When we say the move is complete, you've pressed the clock. Your clock has to record that 10 second bonus, and there's that. Rook to not, A2. Not rook, not rook to G3, but rook A2. He's, he's, he's reaching in his bag of tricks, is uh, Vichy. King to f4, good move by Duda, saying, okay, I know your tricks. Yeah, 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 yeah. King to f4. And again, all white is thinking is like, if I can just uh, trade my pawns for that one h4 pawn, rook versus knight is a draw. It is a draw, but he's going to have to defend that as well. Because we're probably going to go into that position. I, I was really surprised, uh, I believe, I witnessed, I, I couldn't believe my eyes, but it was Erwin Lamy losing against with Magnus. the knight against Magnus in the Tata Steel uh, a few years ago. Check. And I did uh, win that endgame as well. Uh, and it wasn't rook against knight. If I'm not mistaken, it was rook and knight versus rook. Rook and knight versus, versus rook. rook, yes. Uh, when what was the Gary Kasparov versus Judith Polgar? Was that was that Rook versus Knight? Gary won. It's a good question. Yeah. Again, uh, I Judith, have to brush uh, up on my classics. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay, you got to play H3. What else are you going to do? Knight F3, almost against any move Black makes. That's not a check. Knight F3 is uh, White's intention. H3, Knight F3. Uh, Preventing h2. And do not play king to g3. Exactly. Don't play king to g3 because king g3 is going to, you're going to get your feelings hurt after h2. And jumping to Zagreb, Maurice. Indeed, guys, it looked like Anand had a forced win and he missed it. h3 was a bad move in this position. Rook a4 check. King back to f3. The king is now standing on the square the knight wants to be on. And what do you do after just a waiting move? Rook to b4 or rook to c4 and say to white, what are you going to do? You have to mess up the position. You're in Zugzwam completely. You have to move a piece. Your knight's never going to get back to the f3 square. You can't move your knight off the square. You can't move your king because g4 is hanging and the position is lost. Anna missed just this waiting move. He would have won the game with this idea. It would have been over. But unfortunately for him, he did play differently, and it looks like now the position's headed straight to a draw. Thank you, guys. you for, thank you, Maurice, for that insight. Oof. 33 seconds Ooh, for Duda. Bigness. He's playing your uh, plan with Absolutely. G5, King, G4. G5, King, G4. Frankly, <laughs> there's no other plan. <laughs> you got to do something. G5, King, G4, and Knight, you H2. Can play Knight H2 when you need a move. And the fact that the pawns are so advanced means that the black king can't do it all by himself. And I think Ooh, this move allows g6. Ooh, I'm not sure if this was. Uh, I think this actually makes it easier for white. Yes, Duda. Uh, we talk about tactical mm, feelings. Uh, well, that, uh, yes, but, sir. I think right now uh, yeah. Anand is very much in the mode of okay. I want to give you my pawn, and I want to take both pawns in the process. Yeah, he wants to play king, uh, rook, king and rook versus king and knight. And that's what we see. Yeah. Knight to d4. Now we're going to see rook to. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. He's not even going very, to try. Very, very friendly. <laughs> very, very friendly. Uh, nice catch, Maurice. But also an even nicer catch, I believe, was made by uh, Christian in studio here. We're, we're talking specifically about this exact position that I have on my board after knight f2. Uh, and after knight f2, rook g3 missing this marvelous opportunity to sacrifice the rook. King to c4, the bishop goes king to d3. There's nothing you can do to stop king c2 followed by d b2. You're going to have to give up the, the, the bishop. And in this resulting king and pawn endgame, black's king is going to Zugzwang, the white king. Missed opportunity. But we have a very special guest uh, now uh, on Skype. Hello, James. Hello, Yasser. So so nice to be here and talk to you. Uh, thank you. Introduce yourself. I mean, I know I've got this whole list of extraordinary accomplishments. You're an author, hedge fund, chess master, chess boy fan, <laughs> Gary Kasparov fan. Uh, you started many, many businesses and uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, successes, but also failures. Welcome, Jim. Yes. Many failures, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, although I've, you know, studied chess as a young person and now uh, as an adult, everybody tells me, oh, it's impossible to improve when you're a cer after a certain age and I'm trying to prove that wrong. I've, uh, I've been studying chess for the first time in 25 years and again, everybody says, oh, it's, it's too late, you can't be a ch uh, improve as a chess player or a mathematician or a violinist and I don't think that's I don't think that's correct you see all these young people here playing in this great tournament and not that I'm ever going to get to that mm -hmm. level but I of course think it's possible to improve as an adult and you see tens of millions of people now trying to in this past year so you're catching a second wind in your career because you're already a chess master Jim yeah and and again like you wonder at what point is, is it true that older people can't calculate as fast, can't memorize as well? I don't know the answers to that. But yeah, so I listened to your commentary, for instance, and you're so great about saying, oh, these pieces are happier if they're here, or this piece wants to attack over here. Chess is a battle of ideas even more than it is about calculating 20 moves ahead. As you know, as Capablanca would say, I only calculate one move ahead. The correct one. The best and move, yeah. what's the reason why adults can't can't learn these ideas just as as sophisticated as these younger people? Yeah, well, that's a challenge for me, uh, Jim. It's I, I feel like I know as much about chess as I've ever known in my life, but when I'm at the board and I'm spending hours, I don't have the energy that I had when I was, well, more or less a professional, let's put it that way, in my 20s and 30s. How about you? Do you feel like um, you're, you're keeping your energy levels at a very high level four, five, six hours in a row? It's hard to say because I don't know. I, you know, I could say, oh, I, I feel like I'm in my 20s, but when it comes to using the brain in chess, you know, if you're tired, it does make a bigger difference when you're an adult. But look at the formats we're playing now here in Croatia. Exactly. You know, rapid and blitz. Do you feel like your energy levels would be less than they were in the late 80s when you were playing at this at this level? No, no. If uh, if all I had to do was play blitz, uh, I would train. You know. Uh, to be at my very best for two hours in a row, that would be no problem. I could do that easily. And You know, uh, I've, I've watched you play chess, Yasser, on, on Twitch, and even when I see you get into time trouble, that's when you it clicks in. Well, which, where where are my pieces happiest? Right. And, and then you just move them to where they're happy. Right. And you win. That's... Uh, I love it when it works that way. <laughs> now, Jim, what, what's, uh, what about the Croatia uh, Zagreb uh, um, Gary Kasparov connection uh, with this event? Do you know Gary yourself? Uh, yeah, Ga Gary's been on my podcast uh, several times. We're, we're neighbors in New York City. Uh, he's, a, you know, Gary is a great example of someone who later in life has 
has moved on to become great in other things. His, his roles in, in, in activism and human rights, for instance, is, mm -hmm. is uh, advising on artificial intelligence and other things. Gary is a, a true eclectic in, in many fields. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by this, uh, this, this grand chess tour and Kasparov chess sponsoring it because, look, these are the best players in the world playing these exciting formats with, with, you know, it's almost like the feeling of a, you know, sports announcing with you and Maurice mm -hmm. and Christian. And, you know, it's also interesting now watching Napo after he won the candidates match. Here you're seeing him, the, the next contender for the world championship. It's very exciting to see his games against Saric yesterday where he lost or, or yes. Grishik was such a great game where he won. And we're seeing these people at their rust with these faster time, time speeds. Yes, absolutely. Jim, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy, hectic set schedule and uh, joining us uh, as we get ready for our next round. I, I hope you uh, uh, stay and watch the broadcast. I, I'm following all of it, Yasser. I'm loving the commentary. Thank you. Thank you. And let's take a look at our standings before we go on break. After round seven, what do you have for us, Christian? We have Jan Nepomniachi, who is still preserving that leadership position. Uh, Maxim Vashir Lagrave and Vishwan Atananan definitely had a big chance of uh, tying for the top position. We have them at eight points. Joining them at eight points as well is Saric, who only has uh, two games before <laughs> Big Gary is coming in. We have Anish Giri, Christoph Duda at seven points, tied for the fifth position. We have Alexander Grishuk, Shakriar Mamediarov, and Anton Korobov tied for the seventh position, and Jordan Van Forest, who miraculously escaped in the game against MVL with five points in the 10th position. Uh, a huge save indeed. Essentially, I think that was our first and only round where we saw five draws. Uh, it was indeed. You, you, usually we have some victories. That was an important half point or full point uh, that was saved. But uh, as we go on and break, we want to leave you with a lesson from KasparovChess.com. Remember, their memberships are 30% off during this GCTE Croatia tour. I hope you enjoy the lesson. We'll see you on the other side of this break. In this episode, we're going to talk about a study composed by Troitsky. Troitsky was a great composer from the USSR. Um, who was very prolific in the early 20th century. He was specialized, for instance, in fortresses, and this study is the first study I've been uh, given for solving. I did fail, but uh, I was young and naive. Now, if we're going to take a look at the position, the material is equal, but two factors are very much in black's favor. First of all, my knight is under attack, meaning I will lose one tempo. And more importantly, the d pawn is running towards prom promotion. So clearly, white wants to make a draw. Now, if you want to have a deeper look at the position, I encourage you to pause the video. So now we can talk about the specifics of the position. Black's king is a bit unsafe. It only has one square to run from, but for now, for instance, g3 check, king g5 is not useful. So instead, of course, we cannot move the king towards the pawn because the knight is under attack, so we have to move the knight. We cannot create a mating threat with the knight because there's no square where it controls the square on g5. So this way, the natural try would be to go knight d7, d3, and knight f6. And the point is to get to e4, where you can attack not only the pawn on d2, but the square on g5. For instance, d2, no g3 check works, king g5, knight e4 check, and you win the pawn on d2. Unfortunately, after knight f6, bishop b8 check, is a very strong intermezzo. Now if white moves the king, 
now there's D2 and G3 doesn't work anymore. So clearly knight D7 was wrong. The other natural move is obviously knight C6. Now the black bishop is under attack and you cannot move it because if I move it, worst case I can take the pawn and because the H pawn is, uh, I mean, because it's an H pawn and the bishop is of the wrong color, it's an immediate draw. So clearly black will move his pawn toward promotion, which was his plan all along. And now is the critical moment of the study, it's how to, to create an attack. So one try would be knight e5. And after d2 you play f4, so you replace, um, the knight was supposed to control g5, but you cannot do it, so now the pawn controls g5 because my knight controls the square on g4. And I do threaten g3 mate. I also threaten knight f3 check with a fork, but unfortunately bishop g1 check spoils the party and after I take, no, black can queen and win the end game effortlessly. So after d3 we need to find another solution. Uh, what kind of solution is there? What we know is that the king is a bit stuck but first we need to take the bishop because the bishop otherwise help, helps black too much to, uh, to create his own play. So of course black wants toward promotion and now is the actual point of the study. So you don't check the black king yet, you want the king to stay on h4. So you go knight b5, black gets a queen on d1 and now I go knight c3. I attack the queen and very importantly my next move wants to be knight e4 after which the king is stuck forever on h4 because knight on e4 would control g3 and g5 and importantly a knight on e4 would be supported by a pawn on f3 which means that the knight cannot be placed under attack. So after knight c3 black has only one way to prevent knight e4 it's to put the king each check, so queen d6 check. And now I just move my king to h1 and the point is d6 is really not a great square for the queen because if, if I go either king g3 or king g5 that fails to knight e4 check with the fork. And also black has no more check, so he goes for instance let's say queen e5, now knight e4. And for no way it has cannot do anything but he can move his king from g1 to h1 or h2 and also after let's say queen a1 check king h2 you cannot both pre prevent both king g1 and king h1 and like you could do this queen e1 but no g3 check wins the queen because otherwise the king is mated. So black actually has to prevent that and then there's no way to an entangle and so it's a positional draw. Hello everyone and welcome back to our live coverage of the Grand Chess Tour of Zagreb, Croatia. We're about to start round eight, but before we do, we're gonna take a quick look at our standings and show you our pairings. In our standings, we still have Nepo in the lead by one point, group of players in second place, followed by a group of players in third with seven points. Now, for our round eight pairings, Christian, please set the table because we're in what I would call the championship rounds of this rapid chess. Absolutely, and the rapid games, once again, are so valuable because a win is double the points than a win in the blitz portion. We have 
In round 8, Korobov versus Maxim Vashier Lagrav. Jan Nepomniashi versus Van Forest. This is a big, big game for Jan if he wants to maintain that lead. We have Mamedi Yarov versus Anish Giri. Vishwanathan Anand against Ivan Saric. They're sharing that second position big, with eight big points. Game. This is a big one as well. And of course, we have Grishchuk against Jan Kristoff Duda. A lot of exciting matchups for you coming up in round eight. Absolutely, Nepo Van Forest in the fight for second place. Again, that miss by MVL. He's gonna be kicking himself. But before the game starts, I just wanna say, do take a look at Q Boutique because we're running a 75% off special today, including this beautiful t-shirt. You can get your chest swag at Q Boutique, uh, St. Louis.com. Be sure to show your support and represent the St. Louis Chess Club World Chess Hall of Fame with your choice of clothing. And there we see the players getting ready. Our Photographer extraordinaire, Leonard Otis, you see there on just the bottom left of your screen, sporting the very multicolored hue uh, haircut. <clears throat> Have you ever done that kind of a hairstyle? <laughs> I, I wish I did. I wish I did. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I We're was... missing the photos. Our, our viewers need proof, Christian. I do remember a... Um, I think it was Christmas back when I was like maybe eight years of age, and they had these cheap sprays that you just spray on your head right. and you get the green hair. I did that once, and, and that, that was about it. And uh, <laughs> was yes, it working then, for you? Huh? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just a boring guy. It seems like exactly, exactly. And there we have our tournament leader Nepo on the left uh, as they're getting ready for handshake. Jordan Van Forest, uh, the winner of this year's Tata Steel Masters Tournament really not performing well, but I guess, I, not I guess, I'm sure he's feeling very, very good about the result he just had as he saved a lost position. He's inviting after C4, C7, C6, a Slav. This is where uh, Knight F3 and B3 has become a part of um, Nepo's repertoire. He's definitely feeling good, uh, Van Forest, uh, that is, but also there is this lingering sense mm. that he's just being outplayed every single game. He was white after all against MVL and he just got outplayed. He mm. had to survive. This Ooh. takes a toll on you. Whoa, I'm really surprised by the choice of Nepo to go in, in to an exchange slav. I mean, Nepo came into this uh, event saying that you know he wants to train himself and uh, challenge himself in fact uh, whereas the Slav ex exchange Slav in particular uh, C takes D5 C takes D5 has such a drawing reputation uh, on it um, I have to say it used to have a drawing reputation it still does on some degree, but players know that there are options to try to push for white. I've actually played Exchange Slav myself quite a few times, mm -hmm. and I do have very good results with it. I've beaten uh, quite a few very strong players. Um, I think the latest one was by uh, Jun Si here in St. Louis, actually, a 2650 player. It's not that easy. There's a lot of uh, intricacies in the position, and white can create some dynamic play, either on the King's side with h3, g4, and try to uh, push those pawns against the blacking, or on the queen side via the c file. There are ways, and Jordan is playing this bishop g4, which I think is the best way to combat this exchange love. Really? Uh, bishop, bishop g4, g4. yeah. I'm more, yeah. much more used to bishop f5 from many world championship games. And f2, f3, okay, this shows. Uh, a real fighting style. You mentioned that white might want to expand with the move g2, g4, f2, f3 certainly does support that move. He played bishop d3 instead. I guess after knight h5, well, the pawn on d5 is, no, I don't think you, well, geez, I, sorry, I'm just having a, a, a thought that you can't play knight takes d5 because of queen d8 check and this is the type of thing that you want to avoid as white. You've won a pawn but after knight takes f4 you're not proud of the resulting position. I suppose knight h5 can be 
met by bishop to G5. I'm just having some, like having some fun looking at some weird positions like this. I'm not sure exactly what uh, I want as black. If I play the move E7, E6, we should have. I'm a little bit worried that after G4, white gets some space for free. Okay, we'll keep a close eye on this game. I was looking at the game of MVL. He's up against Anton. Uh, Anton certainly has had a roller coaster, uh, a bit of a roller coaster ride, I want to say. He's won some very nice games and he's left uh, some points on the table. Uh, against the Nidorf, Anton played bishop e2, and the players quickly transposed into a Boleslavsky variation with e5, and the players have reached this position after queen b8. I know nothing. Queen b8. Why queen b8 and not the intuitive, more intuitively obvious, I want to say, queen c7? What I believe Christian. the reason for that is, is that you want to uh, keep an eye on that move b5. So, for example, if that bishop from e2 goes to f3, let's say, or that knight from c3 lives to d5, then you're going to have ideas with the queen on b8 of expanding with the move b5. What you want to do is get that rook from f8 and put it on c8. Uh, you have to find a way to do that. Where are you going to put the queen? That is the question that uh, MVL surely has answered so many times in his, in his analysis. He is such a tremendous Nidorf player. This is his territory, territory right now. Yeah. He is analyzing this day in, day out. He's very confident. I can guarantee you he's seen this position in his analysis uh, previously, and he knows what he's going to do. We have queen b8, very, knight very, to d5. Uh, quick Rook moves. To, yeah. I mean, both players certainly within their repertoire after knight d5. And we see this a5 move before the move knight to d5, and this is exactly the reason why, because if you play knight d5 first, I will be able to take that and then play the move b5. With a pawn on a5, that move b5 is all, always going to allow the option of en passant. Exactly. I was ab asked about en passant the other day, and uh, I couldn't help but smile, uh, because the first time somebody played en passant against me, I thought they were cheating. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't do that. And, uh, uh, later, uh, it took me a while to really understand and learn the move. I mean, it was a very tough rule for me as a beginning player to fully understand. And why did he play bishop d8 and not the more natural knight takes, pawn takes, bishop to f5, Christian? It's because after the move uh, c4, that expansion uh, is going to be extremely dangerous. I'm going to get the knight away from uh, b3. Once again, you cannot play that move b5 that you so uh, much want to play. For example, if you try b5, take, takes on b5, knight takes b5, I do have the move knight to a5. And now that knight is coming to c6. If you defend against that, then I'm just going to simply push my pawns. And that's just going to be overwhelming for your pieces that are stuck on the queen side right now. And gotcha. uh, it's not looking good. You do not want to take on d5 just yet. Bishop d8 is a very typical move. You need to play b6 at some point, but the timing, you, is, the timing so is key. You, you, you got to get it just right yep. in all of these cases. So yep. after a move like bishop to d8, now we've been talking about the en passant, the e4 pawn is hanging. So I want to play something like knight d2 and c4, but I can't. I've got to keep my eye on the d5 square. He played the and move bishop to d3. He played bishop to? d3. David 3? Yes. OK. So he does have a tactic. I, I was about to su suggest after bishop f3, you could capture. And in this case, with the bishop on d8, let me just show that. Pardon me. Uh, bishop f3. Why did we put our bishop on d8? Well, because in this case, we could recapture with the bishop, and this isn't so easy for white to get in those beautiful moves, c4, b4, knight a5, as we had just been showing. Uh, but he played bishop to d3. He's not blundering a pawn. You can't just simply capture twice on d5, because unfortunately, h7 is hanging. Oh, king and takes h7, we have and queen an takes d5. On the board. What happened after 
Knight. Bishop d3, he played b5, en passant, a yes. takes b6. Yes. Is there a, a word for en passant in English? It, no. No. Uh, we use no. the French and it just simply means in passing. Uh, the pawn in passing is captured. So, yeah, uh, I always prided myself. Uh, I walked around, you know, my classrooms <laughs> in junior high school. Hey, en passant. <laughs> and everybody looked at me like I was really strange, <laughs> <Were you laughs> which <also> I was. <laughs> were you also saying jadoub? Oh, yes. Jadoub, yes. right? That's yeah, yeah. That's I mean, that showed sophistication in class. Um, I remember much later in my career, uh, I was playing a, a, a grandmaster, I believe it was actually Anatoly Karpov, and I was going to make a move, but I didn't like the way my piece was situated, situated. And I said, I adjust. And Anatoly kind of looked at me like, what does that even mean? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, if I just said Shadoub, he would have been cool with it. But I adjust. I did yeah. the same thing. I moved uh, to the United States 11 years ago. And I, in the first few years, people were saying I adjust. And I was like, I only heard Shadoub in right. all my life as a professional chess player before. And now you're saying I adjust. How am I supposed to respond to that? Sure, <laughs> adjust. <laughs> yeah, what, what is that? OK. A takes B6, en passant, um, and the L finally captured on D5, captured on B6, and I think we're up to date with the players. I believe so. Yes, indeed. Okay, what's going on here? Is the pawn on A6 uh, edible? From uh, MVL's posture, no. Also, his time spent, I think he has more than he started with. Okay. He has 25 minutes on the clock right now. And wow. Korobov is under, uh, well, he's around 20 minutes. So no, I don't think you can take. And let's see why. I, 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 I'll ask the question, you got to answer it for me. Rook takes a6, thanks to my bishop on d3. Now we understand why Anton didn't put his bishop on f3. He was hoping to prevent the move b5 by keeping an eye on the pawn on a6. What's the, what is... MVL have in mind against so Rook let's takes see, a6. Uh, probably bishop takes e3 first. Bishop so let's takes start with e3 that. first. Rook takes e3. Yep. And then is it something with knight takes d5? I'm thinking about knight takes d5, but I almost never like to take that pawn just because I feel I'm uh, allowing you to take on h7 or somehow just checkmate me. For example, in this position, how about bishop takes h7, then rook h3 and queen h5? You can rook probably H defend against that. But. I, I, I thought you were going to sacrifice a rook for a moment there. I thought you wanted to go queen takes d5, rook takes, queen takes h7. Same ideas uh, of what you have in mind, rook h3. I just, you know, make sure you don't get back rank check mated uh, the knight on b3. Interesting situation, but it's definitely a challenge for MVL. MVL's not at the board, and Anton's looking at that a6 pawn with hungry eyes. Um, it's definitely the type of pawn uh, that I very much want to capture. You do want to capture, but you also know that you are within MVL's preparation right now. You think you know it's that. still prep? No, absolutely, 100%. Oh, wow, 100%. Okay. No, I, he's just lounging in his chair. He's getting away from the board. He has more time than what he started with. You cannot just give up pawns like that and not know exactly what you have to do afterwards. Clear. And I think he definitely is within his preparation. Excellent. Anton Korobov might be in a damage limiting mode right now. Trying uh, to find that equality. You think he's actually trying to so. find any, any I believe quality. So. I think he just wants to uh, simplify the position and find a way to draw right now. Wow, I thought that white was still a little bit better myself, uh, whether it was based on knight a5. He took on, bishop. He took on a6. He did. he did, with the bishop with the rook. or the rook? With the rook. Yes, as expected. Rook takes a6, and again, uh, you think that we're still well within MVL's preparation. The depth of, to, of the preparation of today's grandmasters, I find astonishing. I remember uh, studying the French defense, and you know, if I got the first dozen moves, I thought, man, I, I'm so well prepared. Today, it's like 
two dozen moves. <laughs> I mean, remarkable. But uh, let's go around the horn and see some other games. Uh, again, this Wanathan Anand uh, fighting against Ivan Saric for the second place as they're tied behind Nepa by a point, reminding everybody of the obvious team uh, Ivan Saric and Gary Kasparov are playing together. Ivan is taking uh, the controls for this, the rapid chess portion. Gary Kasparov comes in this weekend for 18 games of Blitz. And in that interview that Maurice had with Vichy, Vichy mentioned that he's looking forward to playing uh, two games of Blitz with Gary Kasparov and renewing their old rivalry. What do we have? What, what kind of position is this? This is a very strange pawn structure. How did the, how did this come? Oh, this from a currency ceiling, yes. And uh, I do have to say, I, I really like the way Saric is presenting himself. He's not taking the uh, peaceful, easy route, playing some KG Berlin openings. He's bringing the fight to these players. Mm -hmm. He's playing the Sicilian. He's playing the Zhveshnikov. He's playing E6. He, he plays absolutely everything. He's testing these players in every single variation, and this is what I like seeing from the local hero. But we do have Maurice in Zagreb with some thoughts. Exactly. I would like to focus on this point uh, that Saric is, so far as I'm concerned, the story of the event, showing his stuff, showing fearlessness, really, in the face of stiff opposition, Supposed to be better players, but right now he's standing at second place saying, I'm, I'm just chilling. I'm good. I can play against all you guys. No problem whatsoever. And I think that all of them respect him at the moment. He's been sharp. He's been alert. I think he was in trouble in one game, the game he had on the very first day in the third round. He was able to pull it off and turn the game around and get that victory, showing that he can hang even with the top players. That is, in fact, a very big, big deal. And in this game, he's showing that as well as you talked about that pawn structure, Yaz. Let's take a look now at the position itself. It was in this moment, as we look at it, knight takes on d5, and a traditional person would say, let's just take, capture back on this square, no problem about it, take toward the center with your c-pawn and continue the game. He decided after a long think, he didn't just capture back, he decided after a long think, right here to play E takes D5 and keep the position sharp and aggressive, hitting the E5 pawn, hitting the B2 pawn with the rook. And after castles, he said, yeah, okay, I'll just castle first and now play this position. Of course, bishop to C3 looks like a potential money move, but C5 is gonna be problematic as is D6. So he's willing to go for sharp, dangerous potential, potentially dangerous lines, but he's not Unconfident. He's saying, I'm playing with the big dogs. I want to make other, one other point before I jump. The last round matchup between MVL with the white and Nepo with the black pieces. Does that remind you of anything closing out the first half of an event? Of course it does. It reminds us of the candidates when Nepo was leading and MVL was right behind him, got white. This is in 29, uh, 2020. Got white in round seven at the halfway point of a big event and beat him with the white pieces to catch him before, of course, Nepo had that break for a year and was able to come back and win the candidate. So we're looking at that in the next round. Let's see how that sets up based on this round as well. Guys, back to you in St. Louis. Thank you, Maurice. Absolutely huge. Uh, those matchup th between Nepo and VL and the candidates closing out each of the two halves. Uh, again, Nepo losing in uh, the first um, cycle uh, in the seventh round um, to make it a very uh, exciting event. I need to draw your attention uh, to the game of Anish Giri because I need your extra expertise, Christian. You play a lot of Grunfelds in your life, and you're probably familiar with this line of knight d2 that Shaq essayed against um, Anish in a very, very topical variation of the Grunfeld. Edumacate me. 
I do believe that at this point uh, the position is going towards a uh, draw. Uh, this uh, reminds me of uh, those c takes d4, queen, uh, take, queen a5 check and queen takes a2, the rook b1 variation of the exactly. group uh, that we've seen so many times uh, at top level. And actually these two players have played it in Romania. Uh, in Bucharest, Shak Mamedyarov needed a draw to kind of solidify his place at the top with the white pieces. I do exactly. believe it was, it wasn't the last round, it was the penultimate round. Right. And he did ma make a quick draw against uh, Anish. Right now he's trying a different approach. He's trying to complicate matters a little bit with this knight to d2 invasion on the c file. But black has a huge weapon and that is uh, the pawn on a4. The pawn on a4 is going to go all the way down, all the way to a2, and that's going to be the decoy that's going to uh, force your rook to a1, and that's going to open up some ideas for my bishop on g7 to get active on the long diagonal. Knight c6, everything will have to come with tempo, but black does have to pay attention because if white manages to uh, solidify in the center with, let's say, a move such as e5, close that bishop up somehow, put the pawn on f4, then he's just going to be a pawn up, and that's going to be problematic. Nevertheless, I do believe Anish is within his element. He's seen this position before. He's trying to remind himself of what the theory looks like right now, and I think we're going to see um, a simplification coming soon. We do have this position, and he did play the move, uh, pardon me, I think A3, A3 is on rook the takes B7 is on the board. Okay, and again, I see these variation of the Grunfeld, and it's just, uh, the, the, the depth of the preparation is just overwhelming to me. But let's jump again uh, to Maurice and Zagreb. Maurice. We often talk about depth of preparation, but we assume that the players remember everything they prepared. And that's one of the biggest problems. They admit there's so much to remember that they forget their own moves. Take a look at this position. You said, Christian, this is definitely preparation by MVL. And I think you're 100% right. But in this case, Rook takes E6 by Karabov. MVL may have prepared the line. Bishop takes, takes, and then Knight takes on D5, getting his pawn back. That's getting his pawn back. Instead, for some reason, after rook takes a6, he took on a6, bishop takes, rook c7, c4, took on e3, and now played knight to b6. And it's now possible for this knight to d2 to happen, guarding the c-pawn, and where's, your, where's the pawn you're getting back? b3 is going to happen, bishop to b5 is going to happen. You may grovel to try to be equal somehow, but this can't be what he prepared. This cannot be the position where he said, yeah, this looks good for me. I want to go into this line. No way, no how. There's no promise here for Black that Black will have a great position. So did he make some kind of mistake? Did he forget? We'll see. This is a dangerous game for him because obviously he's a point behind Nepo. Doesn't want to drop further back in the standings. We'll see whether or not he can right the ship. We've seen him do so many times before. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. Jump right in, Christian. Yes, and I just want to point out because I do believe this one is going to end in just a matter of a couple of minutes, three minutes at the most, because we do have the move rook takes b7, knight to c6 on the board, we have e5, and now this leads to a forced variation. As I was mentioning, you do not want to allow white to play the move f4 and solidify the spawn in the center. Instead, you would play a2, rook to a1, and now knight takes e5, and this is the way towards simplifications because mm -hmm. you cannot take on e5. This would open up my bishop. There's no way to defend that rook on a1, and it is actually black who is uh, definitely to be pre preferred even maybe just winning at this point. You're not going to take on e5, of course. You're going to go hunting for this pawn on a2, but I'm going to be going hunting as well for this pawn on d4. We're going to exchange absolutely everything and I have to uh, say, this is probably going to be something along the lines of this. <laughs> We're going to see some bishop f3, bishop e5, and they're going to shake hands very, very soon. A halving of the point. I'd like to turn your attention to the game of Alexander Grishuk and uh, Duda for just a moment, because I am not uh, an open Sicilian player, but it's so rare for me to see white trying to trap a 
black bishop on h5? <laughs> I mean, what open Sicilians, what planet does this bishop ever get to the h5 this, square? This was a new Nidorf, the new type of Nidorf well, uh, where white plays f4, maybe we can go on your board. You call uh, it the new Nidorf. I like that. I mean, I mean, it sounds like style of a book title. Uh, after f3, f4, pardon me, f3 uh, defending e4, white has this very solid uh, pawn, but uh, Grishuk uh, says, okay, I provoked the move h5. I played the move f3 intending g4. I provoked the move h5. I don't lose a tempo because, in fact, that created a weakness. But Duda says, no, your pawn on f3 was doing a good job uh, corralling my knight. I, I have can... to ask you, Asir, yeah. were these type of uh, positions and these type of lines, f3, then f4, uh, present back in the theoretical no, no, knowledge no, of no. Uh, the uh, 70s, 80s? No, uh, because the move h7, h5 became popular much, much later, later especially it was the English attack. Yep. The English attack with uh, f3 and g4 uh, was being, well, let's face it, quite successful. And uh, black took you know, extreme measures and started playing h7, h5. I remember having dinner with Gary Kasparov as he was preparing for his match against Nigel Short. And he's complaining, he says, you know, Nigel, he only has one idea against the Sicilian, F3 and G4. The problem is, this is a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so H7, H5 was the radical solution to stop that, and then White went and did something else. But F3, F4, the new Nidorf, I like that. That's uh, a nice way of putting it. And it's this move, F5, that tries to uh, capture the bishop. H3 is on White's agenda which is why black played h5, h4 in order to give his bishop a square, which is the position we have on board. Um, new stuff, do you know something about this uh, coach? Well, uh, I do know that if a book comes uh, named the new Nidorf, I will ask for royalties. That's <laughs> yeah, for sure. exactly, exactly. We, 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 <laughs> I we, we can discuss. Team. My I people will call your people. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is a very interesting position, and I do have to say that that bishop on h5 doesn't leave a very good impression uh, it doesn't. Uh, to me. Uh, I would say that, of course, you will try to reroute it via f7. So it's very important that if any sort of exchanges come on f6, you're not going to take with a pawn. Because then we're going to have that typical cage against uh, that light square bishop. You're going to have to take back with the bishop, then retreat the bishop back, and then go f6 and try to get back to f7. It's a very intriguing position. Definitely Jan Christoph Duda with the two bishops feels like he's within his element, but also as a classical player that Grishuk is, he feels that bishop on h5 is not that healthy. But we do have Maurice in Zagreb with some uh, thoughts. Actually, explosive thoughts, if you will, well, because of an explosive move by our leader, Jan Nepomnici, but it may fizzle out quickly into a draw, so we just want to keep our eye on it. F6 played by the young Sturva and Forrest, and after the bishop dropped back, knight to d6, queen to c2, hitting the pawn on h7, g6, saying, do your worst. Castles, again, b5, fearless, fearlessly saying, do your worst, and yeah, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to just take this pawn right now and capture on g6, king h8. He's looking around for some kind of move to potentially mate this king. If his rook could get to f3, get the knight out the way, get the rook to f3, and get the whole thing going and get a checkmate. But some queen e8 is coming to deal with this attacking uh, structure that white has. And Jan may look and look and eventually just play queen h6, queen g6 and say, I, I think it's time to go home, uh, at least stop this round and go to the next one. He will have wasted a white, of course, against one of the lower rated players, very dangerous lower rated player in the competition. But it will maintain a bit of a lead, at least for the moment, pending the outcome of the games from the chasers who are right behind him. Guys. Thank you, Maurice. And uh Back to you, Christian, because that game by Grishuk sure is confounding me. I was looking at the position and I was trying to find ways uh, for this bishop to come back into the game. The only way, of course, is with a move f6. The problem is that 
if I go something along the lines of c4 and just try to expand on this side trying to put some pressure solidify this weakness on d6 and then just slowly slowly corral and re-maneuver my pieces maybe somehow land the knight on uh, d5 knight d2 knight d1 knight c3 knight d5 it's a very slow game the problem with this bishop on h5 okay you do have one good thing going about it and that is it controls the d1 square mm -hmm. i'm never going to be able to land a rook uh, there to put more pressure on d6 the problem is that if you try to let's say castle castle i play rook c1 or a4 and you try to go f6 the problem with this sure you're going to get the bishop back but you also cut the action of exactly. the bishop on e7 you um revived one bishop and you buried another the bishop on e7 not only that but this pawn on h4 is mm. also going to be lost after a move such now, as queen to f2 queen now to we're talking my language exactly, <laughs> exactly. i know you love to see this <laughs> yes. i know you, that that's why i'm showing you i'm trying to make you happy yes sir <laughs> thank you but um yeah I'm, I'm i don't know i don't know what his uh, plan is to revive this bishop on h5 is he looking towards an end game that's also problematic because Okay, with the queens off the board, white will have to find a way to stop the bishop from coming to e2. Most likely, that's going to be met with the move king to f2 and try to control that square. Again, I don't see the way to get this bishop into play. The only way I see is with f6, and that's not good enough mm -hmm. because the other bishop dies. I don't like black's position at all. Thank you for that, because again, as a classical player myself, uh, I don't like uh, Black's position at all either. Uh, we do have a little bit of a twist, however, because I'm seeing, uh, I'm looking over Grishik's shoulder actually, and I'm seeing a bishop on the b6 square. So Sasha's approach was a little bit different. I liked your space grabbing c2, c4. He's taken a different approach. but. A big game going on in our fight for second place. You've got it up on your board. It's between Vichy and Nand and Ivan Saric. We know we have a very interested spectator, Juan Gary Kasparov. Uh, last few moves, if you could take us through it, uh, Christian. A lot of things have happened indeed. After Castle, we've seen this move Queen to D4, trying to control this pawn on uh, D5 and control the expansion with C5, because in this position, Black's plan is very clear. He wants to go c5, c4, d4, try to push these pawns and limit the action of your pieces, especially the light square bishop. Because if white manages to get launch an attack on this side via h4, h5 and soften up the pawn on g6, a bishop on d3 would definitely be very useful for potential sacrifices on g6. This is exactly why he decided to go queen to d4, bishop to b7 and b4. Once again, aimed against c5. You cannot allow the move c5 without capturing that pawn and this is exactly what we've seen in the position bishop to b4 and this one is quite interesting but let's jump to giri versus shack because as i expected that one is going to be a draw indeed you call that uh, and i'll just bring it up on my board as the players have made a draw by repetition in that game now where is it on my oops we see them analyzing right now on the big screen. It seems like they found some sort of a bishop repetition. Right. They're discussing the there theoretical is. knowledge that both of these players certainly possess. And I think we're going to see another draw, and it, that is... It was that just that variation that you showed, that yeah. knight takes e5, and they went right into that line <laughs> they didn't play bishop e5 no. <laughs> and bishop e2 as you prescribed they just took the rooks off and then they found a repetition but we very, do have another impressive. repetition coming and that and is jan nepo versus jordan van forest the peace sacrifice that marie showed uh there was no time for rook f3 rook h3 and he just took the perpetual check it seems like the players jordan, discussing uh, feels like maybe jan missed something let's see um, going to use the engine for just a second and see if he had any sort of ideas oh looks like 
zero zero I do not see it. I do no. not see it. And the engine doesn't see it either. It feels like this was a very precise game by both players. And uh, maybe we can ask if we will have Jordan at the end of uh, the day, if yeah. he saw something in this game. I want to jump to the game of Grishuk for just a moment because uh, with the bishop on b6, I do believe that Sasha is taking a completely different approach. I think he wants to get some kind of a, a grip, a positional grip on the queen side with the bishop on b6. It looks like it's time to play a move like knight a5. On a good day, the idea of knight a5 is to follow it up with b3 and knight to c4. The knight on b3, obviously the ideal square is the d5 square, but as Maurice is so fond of saying, you're many moves away from moving the knight diagonally uh, two squares along the diagonal. Back over to you well, that's, uh, for the game between Anton and MVL. That is uh, one big game because MVL, with a victory, could potentially uh, tie for first, but with a loss, he's going to be left behind two points and as we get down. closer to that blitz section that, uh, you know, every game counts only for one point. Exactly. So, huge game this one is, and as Maurice was accurately pointing out, it feels like he missed his preparation, and I will just explain why. At this point, after bishop to d3, the yes, 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 rook to a6. I believe this was uh, the first move that he didn't uh, have in his file, or that he just didn't take seriously enough. Because as Maurice was pointing out, I can just simply take the pawn. Bishop takes e3, take, and then just simply take the pawn. And this is a very natural and, and, and very healthy position for a black. I'm going to come back with the other knight to f6, then this knight probably will land on f6. It is actually black who is getting all the initiative right now. What about what, the rook sacrifice, though, Christian, that I had offered? After bishop e3? Rook e3, knight e5, knight e5. bishop h7. Mm -hmm. uh, queen d5, rook a6. d5. I don't think I'm going to take on... Uh, oh, okay. I do not think I'm going to take on a6 because I, I did not see a defense, a defense against this, right? A defense after queen f7, right. This seems to be just checkmate. There is no way to uh, bring any piece <laughs> on king. h6. No. <laughs> Some, oh, I, d5, you're right. Oh, very nice, Yastro. Very nice. You see? Invisible moves. Invisible you know moves. what you have to do. You know that you have to bring a piece a on H6, H6, but you don't see it. This is right. such a nice move. D5, and that finishes the game. Um, well, rook to H3, rook H6, queen D7, and, queen D7, but and the game flares anew. Well, I get the it. problem is I might have some ideas like this. I got gotcha. you. Rook I takes understand. C2 is met with queen takes uh, queen F5. The, the, the queen B3, queen C8 is still. It's crazy. still a game. Okay, no, no, queen sorry. b3, rook takes b3. Oops. We're not seeing this, oops, uh, oops, this oops, long oops. moves. Yes, good, good, good morning, St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> we do Are wake you? up. But that did not happen. No, Instead, no, no. And, uh, but, it ended up that Anton won, an extra, won a whole pawn. Well, the thing is that Please. after bishop a6, which was, in fact, uh, the move that surely he had it on his, uh, his uh, analysis board, the move was rook to c7, and this is a much more clear picture because this bishop on a6 being attacked and uh, being uh, this uh, whole idea of, for example, c4 is going to be met with rook to a7 and you're having big problems on the a file. That's not the case once the rooks are being traded off. Right. Because after, as we've seen in the game, rook takes a6, rook takes a6, bishop takes a6, rook to c7, he wanted to come back in uh, that uh, position that he knew oh so well. But the problem is there's a huge difference. Without the rooks on the A file, he has this move c4, bishop takes c3, rook takes c3, knight b6, and we have this beautiful landing square for the bishop on b5. Fast forward a few moves. This is the current position we have on the board, and white is a pawn up. Yes. No I conversation. Am, yeah, I understand that white's a pawn up, but that fast forward is my question for you. Because <laughs> go back to the position after queen f1, yes. a very beautiful move, I agree. But play the next few moves, and then you're going to have a question for yourself. Rook a2, gift me the pawn. And then he didn't take the pawn. Why didn't he take? He, but he just uh, played rook a2. Well, if you take the pawn, I have a feeling that uh, rook is going to get lost, right? Queen to a1. Uh -huh. Rook to c2, queen to b1. I'm just following your rook. 
and I don't see uh, a square for your rook. So the whole idea of rook a2 didn't threaten the pawn on b2, but now which the question is why comes, we play what if I go here? What if I go bishop takes c4, knight takes c4 and take, and I take here? That's now true. if you take, take, and check, you, you say, no, it's checkmate. It's not really a checkmate, because I have queen to e8, so, hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe You're discovering uh, questions as well. I mean, the, but yeah, he had played rook a2 and didn't take the pawn, and that he was what I wanted no. to ask you no. why he didn't do that. Because currently, the current position is absolutely hugely favorable for white. White is enjoying a very healthy extra pawn. By the way, as a rook yes. b2 was just fine. I just checked it with the engine. Rook takes b2 was the right move. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask why he didn't do it. He didn't do it, maybe missed an opportunity. I do believe the, cur the he, current position is just bad for black. It, it is. It is yeah. uh, just a pawn up. I do believe that he just believed his opponent at that point. He trusted his opponent that exactly. after queen a1, queen b1, that the rook is going to be lost. Right. Just go a couple of moves deeper and realize that knight takes c4 saves you. Uh, and by the way, that's, that very, very often ha happens in top grandmaster games, that both players, they come to a critical moment, and it's like a, it's not just mutual bl blindness, it's, it's the word that you use. They trust their opponent that the opponent didn't miss and blunder something, so they don't look for the blunder. I remember this happening, especially in a world championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Vichy Anand. Magnus just played this move, king e2, that allowed knight takes d5, and Vichy just trusted his opponent that he couldn't take the pawn. Uh, speaking of Vichy and grabbing a pawn, what's happening? This one seems like it's going more and more towards an equal position. Um, because right now, equal pawns, I don't see necessarily White's advantage um, because the king is just that weak. This pawn on f2 is no longer here, it's on uh, e5, and I don't see this one going any way other than a uh, draw. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. And again, uh, the fight for second position is really very acute uh, between Vichy and Ivan Saric. Both of those players tied for second, playing against one another. And we have MVL versus Anton Koribov. Uh, Anton enjoying an extra pawn. And again, he's had this very roller coaster ride, this uh, wild uh, Ukrainian, uh, leaving points on the table, but grabbing points as well. He's actually, in my view, acquitted himself very well. When we started the show, Maurice uh, had presented some history of these rapid and blitz, explaining why the, the leader of the rapid oftentimes goes on to springboard to victory in the tournament. Uh, Anton, in one of the uh, Grand Chess Tour, uh, was leading in the rapids, uh, Christian. Anton, unfortunately, was the exception. <laughs> to the rule, that he didn't rule. win. Yes, he, he was leading win. in Bucharest. He was playing magnificent chess in uh, that one, but unfortunately for him, that uh, those 18 games of uh, blitz. That's a just, lot. He, he couldn't keep the pace with uh, the other guys. Yeah, 18 games is a lot. B2, uh, B3, just a simply a wonderful interview, by the way. Got a chance to meet Anton for the first time in Atata Steel. And uh, well, I got to tell you, I'm a fan. I mean, he's a very, very friendly, uh, funny man. B2, B3. Um, you know, he actually quit chess for a while. He did. He quit chess for a few years. He went on to uh, study. I'm not 100% sure what he studied, but um, he's a very knowledgeable uh, individual uh, in all aspects and all fields, and quite an interesting and philosophical individual at that as well. He reads a lot. He really enjoys reading a lot. Um, I'm, I'm a fan as well. I've uh, had some time to spend with him in uh, Bucharest, and always very insightful comments from him. Exactly. Uh, I'm an extra pawn up, but truth be told, it's a really hard extra pawn to make meaningful here. Uh, what I mean by that is this rook on b7, uh, eyeballing the pawn on b3, it's caused a kind of a pile up uh, by white. Uh, white has had to uh, play defensively. Meanwhile, this queen could either 
post up on C5, making it that much more difficult to utilize the extra bone, or in this case, kind of tickling uh, around the back rank. Um, does Anton have r realistic hopes of winning this position in your estimation? Um, in my estimation, Christian? definitely yes. Um, definitely yes. He does have realistic chances. But is Why do you feel that? Because, for example, if I do exchange the queens, so I'm expecting something along the lines of queen c3, which he did. Okay, now, I'm not going to trade queens. I'm just going to keep this. Well, if you go to b1, then I go f4. And yes, that advantage. was what I was hoping for. You were? Oh, yes, well. because I was wondering whose king would be more vulnerable. I mean, after all, this king, uh, the immediate. We got a trade of queens, by the way. No kidding. Yeah, queen takes c3 was played on the board. And now queen the question, takes c3, queen, queen takes c3, takes c3, and f5. And f5. I was, I was thinking that after queen b1, f5, I was thinking about this position. This was what was going through my but mind. But don't I have another way of uh, invading right now? After taking on e5, you're going to take back, I would assume, with the, e, uh, with the f pawn. Yeah. And then maybe I can even go c5. Ah. And then hitting my pawn on e5. Okay, uh, instead we got a rook ending, and MVL said, wait a minute, uh, the rook ending is also a problem because the pawn on b3 is um, weak, and on a good day, black's plan is to play uh, e4, e5, that's supposed to be e5, e4, not e5, e3, e5, e4, and king to um, e5. Very interesting endgame. I have to say, this one, obviously, white is the one uh, pressing. He's of a pawn, course, he's a pawn. pawn. I mean. But it could even go the other way. If you're not paying careful attention and my king gets to invade. Right. So, d4, for example, you're in what, trouble. Yeah, just to buttress what um, Christian is saying, is if you play it in some kind of a passive mode, and this king gets, I know this from Benoni positions, where somehow black gets this marvelous king in the center of the board, able to strike in different directions. It's very easy for things to go awry, but I think Anton played it well with king to g3 to momentarily prevent the move e5, e4, h6, h5 on the board. And we're going to uh, most likely see an exchange right now, but that, if we do see an exchange, then uh, we're going to also give an avenue for uh, Black's Rook to potentially come into play via the G-file. Now, also, with the pawn still uh, being on H3, that is nicely protected by the Rook on C3. That Rook on C3 has just such an important defensive and offensive uh, role. If mm -hmm. your Rook from B7 will ever leave, that is going to allow me to go B4, expand on uh, that side, push those pawns, and that's just going to be game over. So black has to maintain that rook, has to keep the rook on b7. He's going to have to focus on those plans that you were mentioning, Yasser, in the center. Mm -hmm. You have to go e4, king e5. e4 always with the king on g3, and especially if the g pawns are going to be exchanged, is going to be met with king f4. But I see you have a, an f4 move on your board. Yasser. Yeah, I was, uh, from the game position, I was just looking. I wanted to point out a, a, a funny kind of a tactic, by the way. it's You don't see this pattern every day. G6 takes H5, G6 takes F5. You want uh, somehow to fix the pawns with a move like F4, but there is this the tricky little move H4 check. The idea is if you take, take, uh, <laughs> talk about a turnaround. I mean, like, you, you know, you just shake your head and wobble. You're, you're like, what just happened? As, you, you know, this would be a howler of uh, massive propor proportions. But h4, and if I play king f3, then you were mentioning that the rook could swing and uh, potentially do some damage. Very intriguing ending. What's happening in the game of Sasha Grishuk? Uh, that was the game where the bishop got isolated. I don't well, know how the, to put it. The on bishop H5. is still there. It's still on H5. <laughs> the bishop is still on H5, what, but a lot of things going have on? actually happened. And I'm trying to understand what happened. I wasn't necessarily looking at this, but knight if ah, okay. 
So this is what we uh, got. We had this timed move d5 by uh, Jan Christoph Duda, and now we see why the queen is so nicely placed on c8. Looking at the pawn on f5, at the same time keeping an eye on the pawn on c2. So this is precisely why the move d5 works. If you take with a pawn, I'm going to take on f5, suddenly my bishop on h5 is a marvelous piece. Mm -hmm. You cannot take with the e pawn, you have to take with the queen. Queen takes c2. This was the big weakness that I was very worried about, the pawn on uh, d6. That's why I wanted to go c4 with white and try to prevent all these complications. This didn't happen. Fortunately for black, right now, they can potentially play the move bishop to e7 and f6 and bishop to f7 and the bishop on e7 is not going to be completely locked out of the game. So fast forward a few moves, queen to a4, b3, queen to b5, knight to c4, bishop to g5. Now we're seeing these bishops come to life and I'm starting to like black already. Uh, take on b5, bishop to e3, uh, knight to e3. This is the current position we have on the board. I can try to go f6, I can go rook to c8. I'm not seeing uh, white's uh, initiative anymore. I'm not yeah. seeing white's advantage anymore. And also, so Trishuk, oh my goodness, he has 43 seconds against nine minutes. And this is a big problem for Grishuk. He needs to somehow solve that. But how do you solve this type of uh, time trouble addiction, Yasser? I've never been able to do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say my protege, but I, I certainly worked with Victor Korchnoi for a number of years, and Victor was always in time trouble, and I did everything, everything, and uh, nothing worked. One game, uh, we were playing in a tournament together, I believe it was in Las Palmas, and Victor's opponent got into time trouble like after 15 moves. And Victor played masterfully against his opponent in time trouble. And I, after the game, I complimented Victor. And I said, Victor, how did it feel? Wasn't that great? You played wonderfully. Yes, yes, everything was, was, was wonderful. Victor was very proud of himself. And I said, uh, but you felt like you were in control when your opponent was in time trouble. Well, yes, it was great. Now you know what your opponents feel like when you're in time trouble. And he was like, Good point. My God, that's a really good point. Next game, he was in time trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had made a breakthrough. No, you know, like, no chance. No I was chance. going to write a book. It's an addiction. <laughs> no, 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 it did help. Uh, but again, this current position, um, Maybe you were we can... saying that white slip, but still that, I don't know, the, the, these bishops. Maybe we can oh. activate those bishops somehow. Uh, Maybe that bishop on h5 actually just... It's good. It's in a good position right now. Uh, avoiding any sort of rook d1, rook to d7, mm -hmm. any sort of active play by white. So I do like what's happening. A lot of moves are happening in the other crucial game of uh, this round, the Korobov versus MVL game. Well, let's jump to it then. When we left it, we just, see, we just saw the move. My goodness, the board looks really different. Uh, we saw the move h5 by MVL, f4 immediately, no captures by Anton, f4 immediately, takes on f4, takes, g5 check, this I'm not a big fan of because this pawn on h4 is simply huge. It will require constant care by white and king to e4, okay, you were mentioning that the rook patrolling the third rank, so very important, check. And whoa, game has blown up. Now, in my view, this is a three result game. Uh, it might, you know, I'm just seeing that this rook is threatening to come to G1 if this rook ever does manage uh, to either play rook to G1 and rook H1, so with the idea of H3. Uh, three result game, but the move C5 by Anton basically says, uh, I don't want to take too many risks. What's going on, Christian? Three, re three result game, uh, but also we have to look at the time. Anton only two minutes against 11 minutes for MVL. So this is mm -hmm. something that I will definitely keep my eye on as the game progresses. 
it still seems to be within the margins of equality, but it's going to be a pawn race. You know that those pawn races usually end up in a position that if you missed a tempo somewhere along the way, right. you lose. Exactly. For both sides, black or white. Right. Okay, so after this move, rook, rook check. Rook to d1? Probably. Yeah, I was just thinking, okay, if I go king to c4, I take the pawn, you take the pawn, I go king to e5, threatening the e pawn. You go check, and now I'm, I'm thinking that down the line, I'm going to give up my rook. And that's exactly but where we're heading I'm right gonna now. Go, I'm going to take this pawn and what you were saying about the race. <laughs> that's I like where some we're chances. Heading. But let's jump to Zagreb and Maurice. Maurice, what are you, what are you looking at? Well, in that crucial second place battle, Anand versus Saric, I am so impressed by Saric's composure and willingness to go toe to toe against the big dogs. He mentioned after he beat a world champion challenger in Nepo, he said, well, now I've also added that to my list since I beat a world champion. Now he's playing because he beat Magnus in 2014 in Norway, as a matter of fact. Now he's playing against Vichy, we know, a five time former world champion. And he said, you know, these world champions, I'm getting kind of used to this. Let me go after him, too. What does he have to lose? And he played from this position here. What he took with the e pawn, that was a statement to me. He said, I'm not afraid. I'm willing to go toe to toe. And we can go ahead. Another move that I was impressed by this move, c5. It looks like his structure is worse. Like, what are you doing playing a move like c5? He said, No, I'm opening up the game. White has weaknesses as well. And let me target those weaknesses. That e pawn looks like it could come under severe attack. Bishop to b4. Anand with a nice tricky move. A5. Let's go. I'm going to attack you. Trade down. And now a few more moves if we jump ahead to how the game went. Now bishop to c6. Again, it looks like black has these double pawns, these ugly pawns. But d6, liquidating those pawns, offering this issue with the exchange on d6. Anand jumped and did take on, on uh, did allow this capture. And now Anand decides to play c4. Look at white spawn structure versus black spawn structure. It's white who's now struggling to try to trade off. Queen a8, an amazing move, saying, yeah, let's open up the long diagonal to your king. Anand quickly defended, dropping the rook back so he can get to the d-file. And after this, he said, yeah, let's go. I'm the one on the attack. Hey, you better watch out. Bishop to d5, shutting down any quick e6. And it was in this position, Anand said, let's please trade. Takes takes and now the move king f7 rook to e2 an easy draw to be had if he plays the move queen to d6 black has played fearlessly this whole game as though world champion yeah, i can hang amazing play by the creation superstar Guys. Thank you, Maurice. And lots of games, uh, lots of moves. I think I we want to say, Christian, focus. in the Anton game, what's going on? Let's focus on that one. Let's put the camera on these players because it's fast and furious action. Whoa. And we have queens on the board. Queen, both both players have promoted. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you don't release the piece. You don't release the piece. Once your hand leaves, the, it's touch move, of course, but. Uh, you don't this should release be a draw, the piece because otherwise uh, your your move is secure. Let's go back. How did how did the, the both pawns promote? Okay, it happened. Rook takes g4, d6, rook g1, rook d3, and there was a trade. And we're going to see a repetition. I see. It's going to be a perpet. Wow. Let's move to the other one, the Grisha game. That one yeah. is on the last stretch so as well. Just to just remind everybody, with that draw, MVL re, it keeps uh, a one point, is behind Nepo by one point. Sorry. Yes, what's happening in Grishuk's game Let's after the move F7, F6? Grishuk got a chance, and he took advantage of it to be able to trade the dark squared bishops. Uh, and the bishop, how finally from H5, is released <laughs> exactly it is but I'm I'm expecting that black is going to want to take con possession of the D file so that he can play rook on d8 to d4 if you drop the knight on d5 bishop f7 and Grisha. by the way Sasha with 12 seconds eight seven six move Grisha 
rook, rook to e1. e1. Wow, not knight to d5. So exactly. he's allowing rook to d4. Knight to d5 would invite bishop f7, and there would be this wholesale trade. This move, rook to d1, suggests to me that Sasha is thinking that he's still no. on the edge. Because he wants to meet rook d4 with knight c2 and somehow uh, get his knight to b4. His the move rook to, to my way of thinking, the move rook to e1 says, I want to keep my chances. You do believe that he's still playing for a win? That I do. I think he surprised. is. I think he's overestimating his position. I like, black. I, do. I like black in this position already. In, not playing the move rook d4, but playing instead uh, Duda, rook to d3 and rook to c2. 17 seconds for Alexander Grishchuk. Sasha's One is saying, look, your, your pawn structure, b5, b6, b7, doesn't impress. And maybe this pawn on h4 is also going to be vulnerable. But it's a, all about the clock. And the knight jumps to the central square on d5. Now we're probably <laughs> going to see <laughs> by, the by the way, uh, alert, alert. I mean, I, I've played Blitz my whole life. And uh, when I see those knight forks, you know, <laughs> knight, knight, knight b4 could... Uh, really sour your mood. I was just going to say, why don't you play bishop f7? Knight to b4. <laughs> and Same those... answer. <laughs> yes. Knight b4. OK, no bishop f7, but now rook c6. Makes that is a, a lot good of sense. move. But we do know that generally, the rooks and the bishop make for a better coordination That's than right. the rook and the knight. Exactly. So um, what is Alexander basing his assessment on? Five seconds. Through. Four seconds. And he is allowing rook to d1 check with this move. Rook to d1 check would force rook takes d1, rook takes c2. Wait a minute, did he miss that move? Pardon me? That's, did he miss that rook move? rook d1 check sure popped into my mind as a... I love that move, king h7, by the way. King h7 is one of those moves that steps away from this knight e7 fork business, which made rook c6 possible. Uh, Duda is playing very well in Sasha's time trouble. Uh, what happens after rook d1 check? Uh, rook takes d1 has to be played. Rook takes d1, rook takes c2. Two. And, and the d1 uh, rook is hanging. Rook to a1. As, and he played it. And he's done it. If you play rook to a1, then, and he's done rook to c2, so rook to a1, then the pawn on e4, to my mind, is vulnerable. Uh, maybe even king h6, king g5. Also, rook to a1 is a very passive move, and you of generally course. do not want to play those type of moves. Not in rapid. Uh, the, the initiative is so crucial. Rook to d3. And by the way, I've just been told that Vichy and Ivan Saric have drawn, so we do have that pile jam still in second place. One point behind the leader, Jan Nepomniachtchuk. Oops. Okay, now it's up to uh, Sasha to prove why he thought he was better. And I don't think this move, rook, knight to c7, is going to do it. I'm not convinced. He wants to play... Knight to e6. Yes. And rook to d7. He wants to play rook to d7 and knight to e6. But if you picture that in your mind and you allow the move rook takes g7 check, it's just one check. In the meantime, I may play the move rook e2 and capture another pawn on e4. Knight c7 on the board. And Duda is comfortable on his clock, is he not, Christian? Not, not that comfortable. 30 not seconds on the clock. as comfortable as it used to be, right? No, 30 seconds on the clock against That's 12 seconds. Now 20 seconds on the clock against 12 seconds. Maybe not so comfortable. How about b5, b4 with the idea? He played rook to c2. Rook to c2. Forcing a commitment from the knight on c7. No, no commitment, Sasha no. says. Rook to d7. I mean, this was his idea all along, was to coordinate rook and knight to hit the pawn on g6. How I believe he missed this move, rook to d7. Yeah, 10 seconds and time trouble. Rook to rook c3. c3. OK, he does, by the way, with this move rook c3, allow himself the move rook g3 as a defense, which he's done. By the way, not only a defense, but the bishop was just about to land on the f3 square after the move rook g3, which is why we saw king f2. Bishop e8 came very quickly 
as the players are, are picking up the tempo. And I have to say, it's so important that that pawn is already on h4. There's never going to be a knight f8, knight g6 checkmate coming on the board because my king will escape via h6. Exactly. And he's recognized he's exactly going for that. what you've just said, which is after the move king h6, there's no checkmate, but knight e6 threatens mate. And I we think we're about to see a repetition. A forced repetition, yeah. I, I've got a feeling that in this ending, Sasha was fortunate to escape. He was. He was indeed, because that bishop, as soon as it was getting active... Exactly. The, it, the game became extremely volatile, but he found this rook d8, knight f8, knight d6 pattern. And once again, I just want to point out the obvious that in a situation where Sasha had his back to the wall, uh, he sought to keep his pieces very active. He didn't go for that passive line with rook a1, which we had considered. Rather, he went for knight c7 and, and knight we're seeing c6. a draw agreed. But that was a contested draw, I have uh, to say. Yeah, hotly contested draw. By the way, did we have any wins in that round? Uh, we did not. So we've had five draws, five draws. Uh, very unusual uh, in this event because we've been fated and treated to so many decisive games. Uh, it was very rare that we had one round, round seven, that had five draws now in round seven and eight. So nothing changed in our leadership group. Essentially, Nepo is keeping the lead uh, as we head into our championship round for the rapid portion of the tournament. Did he miss something? Um, from Christian. what I'm seeing, yes, he did. Yes, he did. He did uh, took on A2 the pawn, mm -hmm. but that pawn is already ill-fated. It's going right. to uh, be lost uh, it, one it, way or the it other. It wasn't crucial. Right now or two moves later, it's going to be lost. What you have to understand in this position, and I don't blame these players for uh, not going into uh, and making time. perfect moves because with 30 seconds on the clock, nobody. Absolutely yeah. nobody is going to make perfect moves. He was supposed to play the move bishop to e8. The idea he spotted later on in the game with this bishop e8, bishop to c6, the timing was this. At this point, he was uh, primed nice. to play the move bishop to e8. Put that bishop on c6, and we're going to get a rook endgame. The thing is, those rook endgames, this pawn on e4 this weakness on e4 even if we exchange absolutely everything is going to be crucial because if i manage to attack it so let's just uh, put some uh, moves on the board let's say knight to b even though knight to b4 allows rook to e2 i'm trying to find a way to exchange this uh, bishop let's say like this bishop c6 take 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 I'm just trying to kind of show. I'm sure there's much better ways to the, the play, even if this pawn is not lost. So imagine this rook on e3. I'm going to make a few moves. The point is that this king is so active and right. is going to come to f4 almost by force. Right. And I'm going to be able to bring the second attacker on that e4 pawn. And that's just going to spell trouble. So even a, a uh, rook equal and four looking versus end rook game, ever four. it's still pretty bad for yeah. uh, white. And this bishop to e8, bishop to c6 maneuver would have a sealed uh, Alexander's fate in this game. Okay, well, let's take a look at our predictions after eight rounds of rapids. I know I had Shaq Ouch. and <laughs> Gary. What do you mean, ouch? Ouch. I mean, I've got 18 games and yeah. I got two You're points good. coming. I'm looking good. You're looking good. Yeah, Real sir. good. <laughs> how, do, how do you guys like your picks? I'll let Maurice take uh, take over on this one. I know he's happy about his. Are you happy, Maurice? You know, when you're an OG, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> just let the facts speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. I'm just going to let the numbers take care of business right now. So you like Nepo and you like MVL. And you picked, uh, Maurice, you picked MVL for the Blitz. Is that because of what MVL was doing in Paris? in the blitz? MVL, MVL is just a tricky player. He's yeah. tricky, uh, he's lightning quick, and you've seen him save some ridiculous positions here as well. That's MVL, and I think he's due for some great blitz play here as well. I think, Nep I think that Nepo is also good at blitz. He's gonna have to show it, 
but we've got a big, big game coming up between the two of them. Can MVL overtake Nepo? If MVL overtakes Nepo, then my pick for the championship might be blown up because he's going to be ahead and then he might win the blitz, according to me. So Nepo has to survive this round right now to feel like he really has a chance. Will Maxime press him or will Maxime say, you know what? I think I can catch you in the blitz. Let me just get out of here without a loss because it'll put him three points behind. That'll just be too much to make up. So we'll see how Maxime takes this next game, the attitude he takes with 18 big blitz games to come. I get the feeling he's going to play solidly in the next game without feeling the need to beat Nepo, given that he has so many games to catch up. Thank you, Maurice. Defend your picks. Quickly, Christian. Yes, sir. I do like the underdog story. I do like the underdog story. Anish was already doing quite poorly at the time that I picked him. Korobov, we know that in Bucharest, he did well in the Rapid, didn't do so well in the Blitz. I just wanted to see him redeem himself in the second chance that he gets in the Grand Tour in the Blitz section and take over. I do know that he played amazing online chess up to this point this year. He's had amazing results. That's why I picked Korobov. But to be honest, I just simply like an underdog story. Uh, let's underdog look at story. The let's take a look at our standings. We came in today uh, with these standings after two rounds. We still have the Nothing's same standings. Uh, we've got Jan Nepo in first. We take have, it away, Christian. We have Maxim Vashir Lagraf. Kasparov slash Saric. Saric is been doing the heavy duty work in this tournament up to this point with nine points. Vishwanathan Anand also with nine points, tied for the second position. Anish Giri, Jan Christoph Duda tied for the fifth position with eight points. Alexander Grischuk, Shakri Armamediarov, and Anton Korobov with seven points, tied for seventh position. And in tenth place, we have Jordan Van Forest with six points. Thank you for that. And as we go on our break, we have a special lesson for you uh, from uh, Kasparovchess.com, from Yovanka Huska, Jovi. It's going to teach you about the opera mate. Enjoy, and we'll see you on the other side of the break. The opera mate is named after the opera game, which probably is one of the most famous games ever played. It involves Paul Morphy, American legend, 19th century superstar, and he was playing in a consultation match between the Duke of Brunswick and Count Isouard at the opera, in fact. Now, this rumor goes that the Duke of Brunswick invited Paul Morphy for just a night at the opera. You know, he said, hey, I've got a box. Why don't you come and enjoy yourselves? We'll have a great time. Morphy, who loved opera, said, well, why not? I'm going to have a wonderful night. So Morphy turned up, and to his horror, the Duke plus friend said, well, hang on a second. Let's play a consultation match. And in order for you to concentrate, Paul, why don't you sit with your back? towards the opera. Now, Paul, as we all know, being a big opera fan, was not impressed. He thought, well, that is not ideal. But he reluctantly agreed. After all, listening to the opera was probably bound to help his chest. So the game went e4, and the Duke of Brunswick and Count Isouard were playing back, played e5, knight f3. And as we saw in earlier games, d6 was all the rage in 19th century chess, d4. And uh, the Count and the Duke played bishop g4, which is already an inaccuracy. Uh, d takes e4. And in order not to lose a pawn, the Duke played bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, and pawn takes pawn. So you must remember at every turn, Paul Morphy is trying to end the game so that he can enjoy the music. So this is why he played bishop c4, threatening scholar's mate. Queen takes f7. Uh, naturally, they didn't fall for that. Knight f6. And queen came to b3. 
Now, black responded with queen e7. Now, it's a very funny moment in the game because I think everyone would probably have just taken the pawn and uh, said, OK, fine, we'll be a pawn up. But Morphy did not want to allow queen to b4, particularly when there was a danger that the game might not end so quickly. So instead, he chose to eliminate that possibility and instead played knight c3. The duke and the count played c6 and Morphy played bishop g5. Now, it's a very curious position because this just looks like a very normal opening position, but black has developed a little bit strangely with the queen being on e7, hindering this bishop on f8. However, when you look closely, it's actually incredibly difficult for black to make a move. If he plays a natural developing move like knight d7, well, now the pawn on b7 will be on prees. So that is impossible. This bishop on f8 cannot get out because, well, that's thanks to the queen on e7. So it was out of desperation that the duke and the count came with b5, trying to kick this bishop away. A chess is timing, and when you have the initiative, you really must play very powerfully. And this is a model example of that. It's not for Morphy to turn back. Instead, he is looking to open lines and open diagonals so he can continue with his attack. Knight takes b5. Pawn takes knight. Bishop takes pawn check. And already you can see there is a big problem with the black king. The king obviously does not want to go into the open with d8. So the player black played knight eight to d7. So what do you do when you have a position like this? You invite all your pieces for the attack. And Morphy know the, knows the rules and so he castled queenside bringing the rook into the game. Now, rook takes d7, bishop takes d7 is a really serious threat. So all the duke and the count could do was play rook to d8, close their eyes and hope for the best. How to continue the attack from there? Again, you must look at ways of continuing the attack with powerful measures. You cannot sit there and play Developing moves such as a random move h3. No, once you have started, you've got to finish. That's why they played rook takes d7, rook takes d7, and now rook came to d8. And black played queen e6. There really is no move for black to play. And here, it's a great moment in the opera game. And what I like about this game is that the checkmate comes in a different square than you expect it to. White's pieces are very active on the light squares and you kind of think, well, perhaps this checkmate will take place in the light squares. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It is the dark square bishop that steals the game. So Morphy played bishop takes rook, knight takes bishop. And we can see the bishop is now pointing to d8. We have the rook on d8, but there is a knight in its way. What do we want? We want to play rook d8. What do we have to do? We have to get rid of the knight on d7. Who can do that? Let's ask our pieces and find out. I think the solution is pretty clear. It's the checks, the captures and the attacks. Queen to b8. Knight takes queen, and this is the opera mate in action. Rook came to d8. It's an attack on the uncastled king, and it's lethal. So develop your pieces.
Hello everyone and welcome back to our live coverage of the Grand Chess Tour Zagreb Croatia edition. After two rounds of play, and this the third day of Rapid, we have all draws. All draws, Christian. That's something very, very rare for Rapid. Highly unexpected, but that's good for Nepo because he maintains his leadership position with 10 points. On the second position, tied for the second position, we have Maxim Vashir Lagrav, Kasparov slash Saric. Saric has been doing the heavy work so far. Kasparov is going to start tomorrow. Vishwanathan Anand with nine points as well. Tied for the fifth position, we have Anish Giri and Jan Kristoff Duda. Then tied for the seventh position, we have Alexander Grishchuk, Shakri Armamedyarov, and Anton Korobov. And in the tenth position, the youngest player on the roster, that is Jordan Van Forest at 22 years of age and six points. He's still looking for that first victory in this tournament. Yeah, my guy Shaq needs to put it together, but there is a lot more chess coming our way in this, the summer of chess. Check this out, everyone. We have coming up very shortly the U.S. Junior Girls and Senior Championships. That's Those three events are going to uh, be played uh, over July 15th and 26th. Then the Grand Chess Tour picks up again with the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, August 10th to the 16th, followed by the Granddaddy of them all, the Grand Chess Tour Sinkfield Cup, August 16th through the 27th. We'll have the ultimate moves on September 7th, and then the Champion Showdown, that is F Fisher Random Chess, Chess 9LX, that will be from September 8th through the 10th, and then we can take a break, but come back in October for the U.S. and U.S. Women's Chess Championship. I tell you, that event is just getting strong, both events are just getting stronger and stronger. Uh, Summer of Chess is just going to be wonderful. Also, of course, a big shout out to our uh, partners at KasparovChess.com for all the lessons that you've been seeing. And if you like the lessons that you've been seeing, be sure to sign up for a membership at KasparovChess.com. You can use um, the hashtag uh, for GCT Croatia to get a 30% discount, and that's running for the whole of this Croatia Grand Chess Tour. And as you were saying, Gary Kasparov himself is going to be suiting up for the Blitz, Christian. Absolutely, and I do have to say, the platform just looks amazing. Uh, not only the lessons, the problems that you can train with, but also the documentaries. Those are the ones that I've been enjoying quite a lot. Uh, there is a documentary about MVL, following him around, how he prepares, what he does for his preparation, his physical preparation as well. These are the type of insights that I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more of. And uh, KasparovChess.com has that for you guys. Code GCT Croatia for 30% off. And yes, Kasparov is coming. Mm -hmm. suiting up to play against these uh, big guys tomorrow in the blitz section. And let's take a look at our ninth and final round pairings as we close the rapid today with uh, these pairings set the table for us, Christian. We have Jan Kristoff Duda, who is warming up in this yeah, event. He's producing a lot of very interesting games, I have to say. It's feeling that way. He's playing against Anton Korobov. We have Saric, the Croatian sensation, playing against Alexander Grishuk. We have Anish Giri against Vishvanathan Anan. We have Van Forest against Mamedi Yarov. And we have Vashir Lagrave, the Frenchman against Nepo. This is the big one. This is the clash that we've all been waiting for. With a victory, MVL can surpass and take the lead in this tournament. Absolutely, and it was something that Maurice mentioned at the opening of the show, how important it is to score well in the Rapids. And as Maurice was mentioning, a lot of the winners of the Rapid uh, portion of these events tend to springboard and use it uh, to uh, win the overall tournament. There you see this very beautiful studio, and, and oftentimes we get these camera angles of what uh, it, it's a curved wall, I want to say, that the players play in. And I always loved it 
going uh, on a beautiful stage. Speaking of which, how is the beautiful stage over there, Maurice, in Zagreb? Absolutely incredible, elegant. The only thing is missing the fans, and that's because of course, the COVID situation. Also, this is a very secure building, the most secure in all of Zagreb. This is where they have politicians come for press conferences and the like. It is the National and University Library. So an important building to be sure. What I noticed there, though, on camera was one lonely man before other people, other players started coming in, and that was Alexander Grishuk. He knows that he hasn't played up to snuff so far. This grand chess tour, a critical moment for him. He did pretty well in Bucharest. I believe he tied for second place. Not a bad score for Grishchuk uh, coming from Bucharest. Needs to maintain that energy here and get some points. But he's playing against Sharic. And Sharic has just been the sensation of the event so far. The lowest rated seed, clearly, uh, the, the lower rated player in the competition, uh, maybe Van Four used to say, well, I'm kind of close to him. But the rest of the players who are supposed to demolish him, no can do. He hasn't lost a single game. You go against these eight monsters and you don't lose a game. You're the backup guy. You, you're the throw in from the country. And you say, uh, wait a minute, if I win now, and Nepo manages to, to well, I guess, with MVL and Nepo playing, somebody's going to be uh, at plus two after this round. But if he wins and Nepo doesn't win, then he's tied for first. For first? <laughs> what, what is that? What a story that would be as Gary says, be sitting back there saying, come on, dude, get it done. Can't expect too much playing against a superstar like Grishchuk, but why not? This would be a dream come true and one of the great performances of his life. Yes, he's won the European Championship, but this would be one of the great performances of his life in front of his people, his countrymen and women, and as a teammate of Gary Kasparov. So this is a game, I know the other game is critical, MVL versus Nepo, we've got to stay on that, but this is number two as far as I'm concerned. No question about it, Maurice. I think I have to just correct you that Ivan Saric has played a fabulous performance, but he's won two games, but he did get nicked in one of the games, but you're right, he's he's playing a fantastic tournament, and no question about it, Gary Kasparov is just cheering him on on the, fan, uh, on the sidelines as we watch this all-important. And what a rivalry this has turned out to be, Christian. Absolutely, absolutely. It's been a rivalry for the last year and a half. It started off at the Candidates Tournament in the first half of the event when MVL bit Jan Nepomniachtchi and uh, tied him at the leadership position. But we see in rapid chess, nice eight wins for MVL, 10 losses. So Jan still has the upper hand with 12 draws. Yeah, and the players have played very quickly. I, I see this, for me, very intriguing idea of queen d3, queen g3. And Jan is and, laughing. And Jan is like smiling <laughs> like, uh, Seriously, it's happened to me probably on two separate occasions. <laughs> I prepared something that my opponents have played against me. Yes. And I, I have a suspicion, a suspicion that when Jan started laughing and he saw this idea of MBL of queen d3 and queen g3, it may be something that he was considering or preparing himself and it just, it, tickled his funny boat. Anyway, after the move queen g3, what's the whole idea behind this? Well, you're just putting the pressure against this pawn on g7, limiting uh, black's opportunities of developing, and with the move d5, d4. By the way, knight b1, going back, mm, knight f6, e5, and Christian, I'm helpless. Tell me what's going on. <laughs> I'm helpless too. I'm trying to explain this move knight to be one uh, to myself, but I do think I kind of understand what the idea is. And that is, of course, he was uh, anticipating the move d4. Where do you want to have your knight when that uh, move uh, d4 comes on the board? Of course, on d2, because from d2, you're going to be able to go to e4, to c4, you have a lot of opportunities. But a lot of things have uh, changed since no then. They're playing super question. fast. Let's see. Let's catch up with them. Well, seriously, 
I mean, knight e4, queen f3, queen d5, a boss it move. It seems to be like some sort of theory. Seriously, posting up in the center, defending the knight on e4, attacking the pawn on e5, provoking the move bishop f4, wrong. After queen d5, I believe bishop d3 was played. Bishop d3 was played. And bishop then b4. bishop b4 check. Uh, not something you really oftentimes see amongst elite players, losing the right to castle, moving your king. And then f5 takes, knight takes, inviting bishop to g6 check. And somebody else loses castling privileges. No, I don't go bishop g6 check. Instead, I play the move c3, inviting you to double my pawns. Uh, geez, every move, I, I have so many questions about each and every move, but let's just catch up with the players after that c3. That is the position we currently have on the board, c3. Jan is the first mm. one to blink and uh, take Pause. a couple of minutes to think of what he's going to do next. Never mind, not a couple of minutes, a little bit more than one minute, and he retreated with the bishop to c5. Bishop to c5. Both players actually play so very quickly. So it fast. was something that Maurice said that really stuck with me as well. These guys look at thousands of positions and they've got these extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary files of the openings, but do they remember? They do remember. Always their prep. We think that there was a bit of a wobble in the previous game by MVL in his game against Anton is what I'm referring to, Christian. Let me just put it this way. They remember much more than grandmasters of a lower caliber do remember because uh, these players are repeating these positions eight hours a day, almost every single day, especially when they are in training camps, which are quite often uh, regular, I would say, in uh, this guy's situation, especially Jan. You know Jan is going to finish this tournament. He's going to go into uh, the Russian uh, Ural Mountains <laughs> training uh, with in his Rocky, sparring partners. Rocky yes. Bilbao style. You know. you know that's where he's going. You know what that's exactly. Um, Bishop B Bishop G6 check. Okay, uh, I would have lost a bet. After Bishop G6 check, Black's king essentially has three squares. F8, no, makes no sense. D8, no, makes no sense. E7, so that you, the rooks remain c connected, I would have lost a bet because King D8, why did he play King D8? I've got too many questions for you, <laughs> <laughs> Christian. You're not leaving the set. I'm going to keep you here for I, hours after this round. <laughs> I, I would use the engine, but to be honest, I'm so fascinated by uh, this position that I just want to kind of wrap my hand around it without using the engine. King to d8, of course. What a, a crazy move. Probably you're going towards the c7 and maybe even b7. You're trying to hide the king on the other side of the board. The problem with going to e7, well, I, I have to say, the problem with going to e7, I don't see it. <laughs> the problem with going to <laughs> I, f8... But the I way you <laughs> built yes, up yes. for it, I was like, <gasps> no, I don't see it. No, I, I do see not it. see it. I do not see the problem with but going king to e7. But king d8 on the board, uh, crazy fascinating positions. Uh, let's see some of the other players who are also jockeying for position. But I have to say, we're going to be very interested in this game. Yeah, we're, th we're definitely going to keep this as our most topical game. I'm just looking at the game of uh, Jordan and um, uh, Shaq. Shaq needs to put together some points, uh, if not against Jordan, who's actually having a very, very awkward uh, bad tournament. Let's just put it like that. Oh, this is another one of those open, but it, it's, it's, that, uh, it's that crazy line with bishop c5 and bishop f2. What do they call that? I, I remember Grandmaster Arthur Yusupov had it in his repertoire. This, uh, what is it called? Ah, uh, good morning, St. Louis. I just can't remember. Um, but it's a double-edged variation. You really have to know. Is it the, the Dilworth Dil variation? Thank you, Dilworth. Whew. Okay, and no, I did not know that. I, I saw it on uh, the Leeches database, which is an okay. amazing tool, and I did say that it. Uh, yeah, Dilworth. the Dilworth yeah. attack, I think, is what <laughs> they, uh, they call it, or so, <laughs> something. Vichy 
Vichy is playing very, very well, or rather his score is very well as he's enjoying a tie for second. He's playing against Anish Giri with the black pieces, this formation, uh, these double pawns on f4 and f2 and d4. I was always suspicious of this line, but I remember a wonderful victory by Alexander Alekhine where he leveraged the e5 square and got to use his f pawns as a battering ram. So still a, a very intriguing game going on there. Uh, continuing around the board, Ivan Saric. Uh, don't spoil an absolutely outstanding result so far. Ivan uh, is up against Sasha Grishuk. Grishuk is like Jordan, do, has, does not have a victory to his credit. He had one loss to Nepo, but he's been playing, I don't know how to describe it, uh, Christian, maybe just too tight. I would say like last year. Uh, well, uh, performance no, he, by Grishuk. Well, lackluster implies that he hasn't been trying too so hard. I think he's been trying really hard. He's just not gotten uh, fortunate. He's been, he's been trying, but only in uh, very special uh, games. I think he's been trying against Jordan. He tried a little bit against Duda in the previous game, and he had amazing chances. But I cannot remember any other games in which he tried and got outside of his comfort zone too much. Okay. Uh, in any case, Ivan Saric, uh, if he were to win, it would be an extraordinary result and it would pr propel Team Kasparov uh, into first or second place and put Gary in a position where Gary might be inspired uh, as he's got 18 blitz games in front of him uh, this weekend. Super intriguing game going on between Anton uh, Korobov, uh, this, I remember we used to, it was a game, Boris Baski was white against a youthful Gary Kasparov in Niksic, Yugoslavia. I played in this tournament. It was the only game that Gary lost in the tournament, yeah? And Boris Baski played a magnificent uh, kingside attack and sack and 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 brought the house down essentially uh, crushed Gary Kasparov so I was there as a witness with Lubomir Lavoyevich and Ulf Anderson and Jan Timon and we watched the post-mortem analysis so you would expect you know Boris Baski is the victor of the game to kind of show the youthful Kasparov what he missed and everything like that absolutely the opposite occurred 12 move variation after 12 move variation as Gary showed boom, 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 what he had, had played and, and uh, Spassky was essentially left speechless. He basically said, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and this continued for a half an hour. The, th the th four of us, uh, Lubo, Ulf, Jan, Timon, and myself, we walked back to the hotel, a 20 minute walk, and we didn't say a word to one another because this uh, analysis that Gary showed just, he, he was years away from playing for the World Chess Championship, but we all understood that's the guy. <laughs> I mean, that was what was happening. Gary was amazing. This is a super, super double-edged uh, position. They don't play it uh, anymore, it seems to me, like in top, because the Kings Indian itself has, uh, and guess who joins the tournament tomorrow? I just, I, I can't help but uh, express my admiration for Gary Kasparov, the player, as he will be playing in the Blitz. Um, first of all, it's the King's Indian. Then the same-ish variation of the King's Indian itself has not been very popular. Everybody's playing the Gligorich, Bishop E3, Bishop E2, or the very standard stuff. And these double-edged positions were white castles, queenside, black castles, kingside, kings on opposite flanks. Everybody attacks one another's kings, and it's fireworks on the board. Well, so. I have to say, in, against uh, the Zamish especially, I, I think recently 
players usually go with c5 instead of this idea of e5 and that's kind of how they tackle the Zemish and that's why uh, players as white have more or less um, rarefied their option as uh, the Zemish. They, they don't play it as much anymore. Uh, but this e5 is supposed to be very double-edged. Nevertheless, with the emergence of the new engines, mm -hmm. it usually gives white quite a sizable advantage. Um, let's wait and see whether these players are going to know exactly where to put their pieces, know exactly how to launch their attacks in the right way. This is definitely a type, the, the type of opening that you enjoy playing in a rapid game. Yes. And this is, you don't enjoy too much playing it in a classical game and getting squashed on the king side, <laughs> getting checkmated as a uh, black. Right. But you do enjoy it in a rapid game because you have much more practical chances. You're going to put a knight on d4, you're going to uh, uh, give up a pawn, sacrifice a pawn, open up that uh, bishop on h7, and at some point, maybe things are going to get connected for you and you're going to be able to find that counter chance and uh, if white doesn't have too much time to think his defense through then he can get definitely very quickly in trouble and uh, that is exactly what we're seeing in this game very good and you've got the dilworth uh, game in front of you what's happening in I, that one uh, christian well uh, what uh, draw my attention is that i've seen mamediarov's uh, name in this variation as the only game that was played in this line after so knight to f2, of course, we see the deal word variation, rook takes f2, f6. We're not going to take uh, this rook on uh, f2 first. We're going to open up the f file, try to create some activity on this side. Now you have to take on f2 because if you take on e5, then with my knight on f1, I'm supporting this blocking of uh, the diagonal, very important diagonal, and this is just simply lost for black. But of course, after knight to f1, we take on f2, king to f2, take on e5, now I'm threatening the move e4 to win another piece. So you have to get off the f-file, sidestep with the king, get it back into its house on g1. And now we see this move bishop to g4, this is a novelty. In the other game that was played uh, in this line, queen to d7 was played in one of the games, or queen to d6, which was uh, Chakriyar's choice in his game against MVL and uh, this variation all the way in 2018. Bishop to e3 and uh, actually Bishop e3 was not played I think it was something along the lines of Knight to g3, h6, Queen to e1, Bishop to g4 and we get this complicated position where black two has pieces. two pawns and a rook for two pieces. Right. It's a very imbalanced position with chances for both sides. Let's see what's going to happen in uh, this novel game that we're seeing right now. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, speaking of a novel game, we got a little bit away from it, but we'll come back to our game of the round between MVL player tied for second against Nepo, who's in clear first. Uh, some, again, so many questions about this uh, position. King d8, c3, uh, right here. You would think that with the king and the queen on the d file, you want to play the move queen takes c3, keep the queen's on the board, the king on d8 being a target. No, you take with the pawn. Okay, after e6, e5, c4, you think, okay, I'm gonna recapture with the knight to keep my pawns in uh, my pawn structure. No, because that would allow a knight g4, so you recapture doubling your pawns. After bishop e6, black's king has gotten a certain measure of protection, king uh, g2, uh, on white's agenda are the moves bishop b2 and knight b3 as well as rook e1. Black has no intention of allowing white such an attack. He just played the move rook b8 and Christian, <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask you. What's going on? Somehow, somehow we actually ended up in a more or less normal looking normal position. Normal looking. Out right. of nowhere. If you would have told me 10 moves ago that we will end up with all the queens on the board, with the kings fairly safe, nothing explosive happening on the board, we're going to get this strategic endgame where both players are going to try to focus 
on the weaknesses in their opponent's structure, right. I would have told you, are you crazy? Right. Are you crazy? Look at the position. Of course, this was the moment that probably White would have had this move queen to e2 to try to backstep a little bit, but keeps the queens on the board. And this right. is crucial because this queen from d5, it's beautifully placed right now, mm -hmm. but it will be kicked out via c4 very, very soon. If you do keep the queens on the board, I have to say, it does feel like white's king is much sa safer than black's king. And this is exactly what you're looking for in this type of crazy positions. Now, also king after C4 let's, C4, let's say something along the lines of C4 in this position, you get the queen to E6. Now, this also cuts the action of the bishop. So you are wondering, how would I take my rook and get it into play. Well, now with the queen on e6, which is a very natural square for the queen, I have the option of playing the move mm. rook to h3. And that's basically just a castled king right now. A castled right. king, very safe king. This rook is going to swing either to d3, either to b3. It's going to create some damage. And this is probably the best chance best that chance. MVL had. Instead of that, he did play the move c4, and now we see this uh, trading of the queens and we do get quite a natural position black is going to go with the king to c7 i think we're caught up right now weaknesses and for both sides but i would say at this point the position remains balanced yeah the evaluation though if you were to you would you prefer white's position or black i mean the pawn structure is so crazy yeah it's I mean, it, it, it takes time to really adjust yourself to try to understand, you I know, do like black, actually. who has the initiative. You like black. I We've just like seen black. the move rook d1, which has a very direct threat. You mentioned king c7. I'll also mention king e7 in both cases, getting out of the pin, defending the bishop, certainly not allowing the move c5 by blundering with king d7. But why do you like black? Where do you put your king? Well, Aston answered he put his king actually on e7. You had mentioned c7. The reason why I didn't think c7 was the right square was because I started to be attracting to, attracted to ideas of c5 and f4. And I was, I was looking at a line where you go f4, you take, and I take on d6. I don't know if I get anywhere, but that wasn't the case because after rook d1, very quickly, king e7 was played. You were asking me why I like black. I yeah. hope that you will not ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually going to tell you not to ask me that don't, question. Don't, please. Please don't ask me <laughs> why Leave me I like alone, black. I understand. Uh, uh, I they're not know. paying us enough for <laughs> to, to, to get the, You gotta become a premium <laughs> member. Uh, that, that's what I'm thinking. Oh. Okay, king e7, c4 is hanging. But that's not what it's all about. It's about whether or not I can harass the king. Uh, let me show you ideas that I might have if I was in, um, in white shoes, which is a, a move like bishop g5. And I want to follow it up again, again and again with this move f4. If I can get the open highways, right? We always talk about opening lines against the opponent's king. Something like rook d4, rook e1. And you know I'm a pawn grubber, so if I'm sitting here throwing pawns at you, you know, it's because I believe the initiative is something uh, that's very real here. And uh, MVL is going to have to use this initiative because if, if he miscoordinates just a moment, Black is just going to be fine. And so he's got to strike. If there's an advantage in the position, he's got to strike in the next move or two, uh, Christian. Absolutely, yes. I do think that he has to strike. And you were showing some very, very fascinating lines with bishop g5 and f4, trying to take advantage, still trying to take advantage of the weakness of the kings. Exactly. Even though in the end game we're told that, oh yeah, the kings should be it were centralized. Center, centralized. Yeah. But this, I wouldn't even call it an end game yet. No. This is a middle game without queens. Right. We have so much dynamic activity on all sides, both sides of the board, that I cannot call this an end game. That king on e7, 
you have to keep uh, your position very compact. That knight from f6 can never leave because bishop g5, as you were mentioning, and the king is going to get attacked. You have some difficulties on the dark squares, but you have some guardians around it. And yes. that is what saves black's position right now. The king on g2, much safer, of course, but that comes at a cost, and that is the pawn structure. The pawn exactly. structure of white on the king's side is Across the not board, ideal. Actually. A2, C4, every pawn is isolated or doubled. Yes. <laughs> yes. Know, this is not what you would call a beauty uh, in terms of a pawn structure. So this is crazy. What other games are going on that uh, I'm very, very curious about the game of Shaq. We've just seen the moves Bishop G4, Bishop G5. And let's ask Maurice what he's keeping his eye on. Maurice. I'm keeping my eye on all the games. Yeah, as you know that, I'm responsible. But there are some games that catch your eye all of a sudden, and you say, wait, 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 check this out, folks, because it looks like Geary has blundered. Let's Ooh. take a look. In this position, he looks like he has a space, definitely, against Anand. Anand is trying to somehow keep the position intact. Notice Anand has the two bishops, but Anand doesn't like having the two bishops. He prefers to have the knights to the bishops. So what does he play? Knight to f5, and Gary said, I know what you don't like. I'll take, bishop takes f5, and I'll give you the two bishops where I keep the two knights. E takes on f5, a surprising move. He could have captured back this way. I guess it's not so surprising, sacrificing a pawn, but this capture would have been very solid. Instead, he took back after bishop takes f5 with E takes f5. Now, Gary could have continued the attack with h5 in this position. Keep building, keep building. He's got the space. He's got the Anon knights. But instead, he got greedy. After he takes f5, he said, why can't I just snack on the d-pawn? Of course, there's this pin along the diagonal. His queen is being pinned. His knight is being pinned to his queen. And what is he going to do about a simple rook move? Rook to d8. How do you deal with this as bishop takes knight is on tap? Bishop to b4 will come after that. So what I mean is if you break the pin, takes, takes, and suddenly this move appears on the board. Your rook on e1 is hanging. Your queen is hanging on d5. Knight takes d5. A very risky move by Geary. Anand has not moved as yet. What did he prepare against knight takes d5? Maybe he's checking his own ideas. Uh, as it looks like, this move, rook to d8, very straightforward, preparing this pin on the queen is going to cause some consternation to Geary. I don't know what Geary has prepared. Knight f6 check runs into king to g7. Quite simply, your queen's hanging and your knight's hanging, so that's nothing. Knight takes d5, folks. Rook d8, if Anand wins this game, he could jump into a tie for first after this round. We're talking about Saric being a story. The old legend, not so old, but 51-year-old five-time champion coming in after having played no chess. Again, rust? Question mark? Mm. What rust? Anand really showing how to get it done against his younger opposition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Uh, a lot of double-edged games. We haven't seen the decisive games uh, yet, Christian, but I'm telling you, we're seeing some really great fighting at chess, and <laughs> I'm looking at your board uh, as an example. Absolutely, yes, yes, sir. Uh, I was looking while Maurice was presenting beautifully that game. This one that we were mentioning, the Duda versus Korobov matchup, because this one is explosive. In this position, the Zemish, uh, knight to g3, knight goes to g3, try to join the attack, try to support the avalanche of pawns on the king side. But very well timed is the move e takes d4, bishop takes d4, and c5. This uh, looks like it doesn't work because, sure, you're on this uh, uh, semi-open file. I have two attackers on the semi-open file. Look all the way to the queen. You have only one defender. So this pawn on d6 is supposed to be pinned. I'm going to take on c5. And this is exactly what Duda went for. It looks like black is just uh, losing. But boom, you, have a, you took a pawn, I took a pawn. Not only that. But I'm also opening up the line for another defender, and this allows me to take on c5 on the next move. I believe 
Duda played a move queen to f4. This is the current position we have on the board. There's so many pieces <laughs> on pre right now that I just simply don't know exactly what's happening in the position. Uh, yeah, good luck. Maybe b4. Maybe b4, something like that. They leave even more pieces on pre, but try to break through on this side because this is key. Of course, knight to d5 is most likely going to be met with d6, d takes c6 because that cuts the action of a Daruk. Do you want to go back? I don't think you do because uh, opening up, allowing this opening of the bishop, knight takes c4 also coming. At some point, I'm just simply going to give you this bishop. I'm going to be like, okay, you take my bishop, you be a piece up, but if I manage to go knight takes c4 and queen to a5, so I'm thinking about positions such as this one. Right. Queen to a5, attacking this bishop on c5, attacking the pawn on a2, just the position simply explodes, and I do not think is exploding in a favorable way for white. This is definitely black's game. It's messy right now, but I could see Korobov in his style just dominate this uh, scramble. Well, three words, fabulous. I mean, this is great stuff as uh, the Ukrainian Grandmaster brings it and jumping uh, to Maurice and Zagreb. <laughs> this is an explosive round, game after game with just tons of excitement. This one between Ben Forrest and Shakir Marmadirov after bishop g4, bishop to g5, we know this is the typical blunder, right? You're about to lose a piece after bishop takes on f3. Your bishop on g5 is hanging, the, qu the queen on d1 is hanging, but queen d2, now your queen on d8 is hanging with still the bishop on f3. Queen moves to d6, g takes f3, and now e4 barging right ahead. Let's go. If you take on e4, then knight to e5 with threats to the f3 square, and mm -hmm. this one is just wild i mean completely insane position this one's sick we should point out the game with anon by the way when knight takes d5 he did play rook d8 he countered captured with bishop takes on a3 his point being if you take he's just going to play queen to d6 and pin and win back the knight directly guys it looks like game after game there's just madness and mayhem breaking out. Let's see if we can keep up as these players saw 10 draws happen and said, nah, we can't have any more of that. Let's play some exciting chess this round. Fantastic. Thank you, Maurice. And uh, uh, going back to our game of the round, the MBL Jan Nepo. Uh, I saw this move Bishop D3 by MBL and it just feels too soft to me. I think that after the Bishop retreated to G6, it gave Black's King a uh, square to hide and instantly, in fact, Nepo played the move king f7, and whatever there might have been in the position, it feels to me it's slipping passed, away. Slipped away. Uh, it was just there for a moment, and it's no longer there, Christian. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like uh, Black has managed to stabilize exactly. the position, and he's going to be able. Of course, we were talking about the weakness of the king, right? right? Right now, on f7, the king is perfectly placed. And this is the strategic maneuver that he was supposed to find. King to f7 and get the bishop to e7. That's going to break that pin on the knight on f6 and give some health to that knight on f6. He's going to be able to take on e4. He's going to be able to do a lot of things. And this is exactly what we are seeing right now, of course. MVL also... That knight on b3, it almost acts as a defensive piece because you do not want to allow that rook to invade via b2. But he decided that he wants to place it on a more central square, maybe even go to g3, which we see just happen right just now, as you were attacking speaking. that pawn on h5. As I was speaking, yes, but... Is that a big deal? I, I mean, don't, I don't I see like, it. I, I don't like see rook b2 it. and what you were saying. That made perfect, oops, excuse me, that was my my, my bad. Uh, what you were saying, your rook comes penetrating uh, the second rank in this case. Yes, if you want, you can give up your bishop and take that knight, but this bishop is heading to c5 and no, 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 I'm not a fan. I don't like what has happened in these last five, six, seven moves for, uh, for MVL. 
He did not play knight. Uh, he did not play rook to b2. He played bishop c5. After knight to g3, bishop c5. He said bishop to c5. Okay. Funnily enough, I actually like the bishop on e7. I like the rook on b2. Looks to me like he's pre Are we going prepping. to see a repetition? He played knight to e4 back. We might ah. see a repetition. Um, I'm not sh sure. Are we going to see a repetition? What happens after knight takes e4? Help me out, Chris. The, I've had so many questions in this game. I just don't know what's <laughs> what, what to pick from. If That's I go, okay. If I take on e4, if you, take on e4 I think you can take on d8, but I do have knight no, f2. No, I think I will take with a bishop on e4. It's okay. Just, but ooh, then, he took on e4. Yes, exactly. It looks to me like this was opportunity knocking. If you recapture with the bishop, then I will trade on d1. Now that bishop on g5 is hit, hitting an empty square, and I will drop in with an invitation to play rook to b2. I mean, there are three pawns knock, hanging in knock black. <laughs> with that rook. Yeah. This is not looking good for white. Exactly. I think the move knight e4 was a, an error, actually. I think the move knight g3 was an error. Bishop c5, Nepo showing why he's been in the lead, and he's playing very well. He's outplayed MVL, in my view, in this all-important, crucial game. That was a crazy move that Maurice was showing in the game of Bishop Anon with bishop takes a3. Uh, talk about unexpected. What the heck is going on in this game? We've just seen knight f6 check, king g7, uh, Christian. Are we going to see knight h5 check? Well, let's and see. Let's see. So after knight takes d5, bishop takes a3 was played on the board. Right. Now we see this move, uh, knight to f6. It seems like the king is ready to go to f6. Right. King to g7 is ready to uh, go to f6 because we're going to exchange the queens. If you decide to take on He's, a3, which he did, he take on a3. I'm expecting queen takes a3. You do not want to leave the queens on the no. board if the king remains on f6. So queen takes a3, b takes a3. This was actually played. This is the current position on the board. And I have to say, I do fancy this knight on e5 for white. It's a very beautiful piece. But yes. as we were mentioning, the rook and the bishop in the end game is a tremendous cooperative force. Mm -hmm. Now also, and this is exactly what white uh, decided to do. His trump. If you play any other move, I'm going to land this bishop on d5. Absolutely. And that's going to be a very, very bad strategical situation for white because no there's question. no way to kick that bishop on d5 without reshuffling this knight maybe to b4. Very difficult to get there. In the meantime, black can do a lot of things. Right. So he did play the move a d5. He's going to try to use this uh, pawn maybe as a decoy uh, against, at least not as a decoy, but as a preemptive measure against any sort of infiltration on the C file. You're going to be able to get one of those rooks there, but you have to be very careful. If that pawn lands on D7, and then I have the control of the C file and manage to uh, penetrate via the seventh rank, you're in trouble. So you have to be very, very careful what you're going to do against this pawn on D5. I'm expecting something rook along D8. the lines of rook to D8, rook to d7, rook to c3, and we're going to have this type of very dynamic battle in the endgame. But let's go to Zagreb and Maurice. Another dynamic battle, though not in the endgame, is this one between Saric and Grishchuk. Let's take a look as Saric has been playing so well in this tournament, well under control. He doesn't want to spoil it in the last game, but he did get in the break d4 in this position, takes, takes, and takes, rook takes, and you can see opposite colored bishops, disparate pawn structures. You can see that white has a, th a four to three on the king side, and black has a four to three, but with the compromised pawn structure, as is typical of this opening on the queen side. So c5 trying to correct things, and then c4 saying, I don't want with this opportunity to trade off my double pawns, I don't want to miss this chance. So rook to e3, and now after a couple of moves, he did trade. And so we see the 3 to 2 on one side and the 4 to 3 pawns on the other. Knight to e5, I like a moment like this. This kind of geometric moment where every square on the e-file 
is occupied by a piece. It's not something you see often in chess where a file is completely filled, a big lineup where there's a pawn sitting on the file as well. Why are these three white pieces trebled on a line where there's a pawn sitting there? Very interesting moment indeed. H3 played C5 and now the move knight to F5 attacking the queen and chasing a piece off of that square. Now, F4 is possible by white. What is white supposed to do to maintain the energy in this position? The B3 pawn currently is hanging as well. So dynamic as ever, any slip could count. But let's point out again, of course, what, a, what would a Grisha game be without time pressure? 15-10 <laughs> for Sharich and 5-52 for Grishchuk. We've got one of those barn burners. Let's see what happens as the Croatian star tries to maintain his fantastic and maybe even increase uh, his fantastic performance. Guys? Thank you very much, Maurice. Barn burner indeed, but another barn burner is going on between Duda and Anton. And I tell you, I, I mean, okay, it's just my early morning wake up. Long before it to I'm be dead. <laughs> I'm dead. I mean, bail me out, Christian. Tell me what's going on here. I, 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 I don't know. I don't Thank know. Yes, yeah, sir. I don't know. <laughs> I did see the move before. I didn't right. say this. The, the the type of attack that you would see from Korobov. This exactly. is the type of move that you expect from right. uh, the Ukrainian superstar. Before a knight to b1, queen to c8. So I this was this a very intriguing way of getting the queen off this uh, d file. Very good way of doing that. Take on g4. Queen takes c5. B3. Now, this is the position we currently have on the board. I'm trying to find ways for black to break right now because I need to find a way to break. If I don't break, then you're, I'm going to have a pretty difficult time. Nevertheless, this bishop is also one of the big weapons in the position. Huge. You see it all the way to h8, all the way in the corner. But if this diagonal opens up, and it could open up at any point, with sacrifices on e4, on d5, on g4, anywhere on the board. Right now, this is definitely something that you could be thinking about. Exactly. Because you uh, use your knight as a decoy. This queen gets off the h6, c1 diagonal, and then the queen enters the fray. Mm. This one is interesting. I'm not 100% sure if it works. We will have to wait and see whether Korobov thinks it does work. Of course, you cannot go knight to d2. Whoops. That just allows the checkmate on the long diagonal supported by that bishop. If you go rook to d2, then I have ideas of bishop to c3 as well and putting some pressure, even ideas of d5 and trying to open up the position in that way. Keyword in this position, options. Mm -hmm. Black has options and very limited time to choose them. Nevertheless, a very dynamic battle on this one. Thank you, Christian. Too difficult for my brain. My brain hurts. Uh, let's go to Maurice and Zagreb. Well, it's Vichy's brain that might hurt after the next move lands on the board because here we know he missed his chance rook to d8. That would have been a great idea in the position. Instead, he played bishop takes a3. And Geary continued with knight f6 check, king g7, and with his queen under attack from the bishop, played queen takes other bishop to trade off pieces. Here, of course, queen takes on a3, b takes a3, and now king f6, and d5. And you can see white pieces are all lined up to help Derek the deep pawn run down the board. Now, Anand had to be very careful here. He played king back to g7, king g7, and Against this move, d6, rook to c3, everything okay? Boom! No, it's not. Knight takes on f7 by Geary, an explosion in the position, grabbing that pawn. King takes will be met by rook down with check, king to f6. Gift me the bishop and two pawns under attack. I'm not even mentioning good old Derek trying to run down the board, but the a7 pawn's hanging, the h7 pawn is hanging as well. White has stolen a pawn in this position with activity. This looks like Geary is completely in the driver's seat. Anand in deep trouble, missing his chance. He's going to live to regret it if Geary plays all the right moves. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, 
yeah, that king g7 looks egregious as he overlooked knight f7, usually the very tactical alert. Talking about stealing a pawn uh, is a Nepo as he suddenly grabbed this h-pawn. We were talking about potentially uh, black losing the h5 pawn. No, it's white who has lost the h-pawn, and it's Nepo for choice as he's got the extra pawn. He just played the move king f6, uh, talking about... Uh, keeping your king in the center for the ending, and uh, he's eyeballing bishop g5. Uh, I think that this is a very nice advantage, but this game, you've got Christian with Anton. I mean, it, it, it's really, it, it defies understanding. No, this is a barn burner, uh, this one, and as you were mentioning, Yasser, you did predict that game of Nepo quite well. It was Black who was taking over the initiative, and right now Nepo is in pole position to extend his lead. But this one, we were discussing it just a few seconds ago, and we were mentioning that, okay, the position is materially equal, but Black seems to be having some initiative. You would expect a slight advantage, maybe mm -hmm. a plus 0 0.5, 0 0.1 if, uh, if you want to uh, get ambitious. It's minus 4.7 in this position. Minus 4.7 by the engine. I just checked with the no engine. Way. Black is completely destroying white on the dark squares and white cannot do anything about it after the move knight to d7 but he didn't play he it. did not play it and look what he played instead he played d5 and this is the type of move when you are anton korobov you've been playing this type of games all your life you, the temptation is too much to handle you cannot you, you see d5 on the board you see that you're living a night i'm pre you know that this one is your chance to get in the history books and this is exactly what he's doing he played the move d5 Black still has an objective advantage in this position. Let's see what happened. Take, take, take on f4, take on c4. We have this position. The only goal for a black right now is to open up the bishop on h8. If right. you manage to open up the bishop on h8, the game is over. Clear. So we'll have to wait and see whether he manages to do that. Do not let white stabilize with the pawn on e5 because then you are the one in trouble. We used to call this in search of Mona Lisa. <laughs> uh, you play a move like D5 because you're, this is going to be your Mona Lisa, your career-defining game. Instead, of you could just move your knight away and win pedantically 4.7, but, but the search for Mona Lisa induces the move uh, D5. Uh, Double-edged affairs all across the board. I just want to uh, refer to the game of Jordan Van Forest and Shaq for a moment because that was a game where we saw this move uh, e5 e4 as mentioned capturing knight e5 and you're staring down this uh, knight f3 check square and Jordan you know rolled with the punches he moved his king so that uh, knight f3 didn't land with check and he put his queen on g2 and he said do your worst um, Shaq said I need more pieces in the game I need uh, more attackers please rookie eight l take my pawn let me play a move like knight e1 so that I can play queen takes d5 and knight takes c2 no mm, <laughs> no 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 said Jordan I don't want to fall for a brilliancy either bishop e3 c5 knight g3 d4 rook d1 king h8 I mean for Rapid chess, uh, the players are playing Donnie Brooks all over the place. They just haven't been able to get the wins. Let's jump back to Zagreb and Maries. Guys, I'm looking at this position and I am befuddled. And this, this could be a masterful defensive setup by Anand to save a two pawns down endgame. Take a look. Knight f7, king f7, rook e7 check, king f6. Give me your bishop, rook c1, let's trade that off. Put a king on g2, h5, give me a second pawn. That's two pawns. I know Yasser is counting these pawns and going, yum, yum, you must be busted. Rook to c6 played. But now his niche has paused. If he gives up this d pawn straight, then his double pawns on the king side will make it almost impossible for him to win this endgame. But here's the problem. d7 
can be met by king to e7. And now when you try to bring your king into the game, rook to e6 can be played. And the question is, if like how do you make progress? Let's say you play rook b7 and black says, okay, I'm gonna just chill. How do you make progress? A4, A5 does nothing. How do you get your king into the game? How do you cross over? You're up the two pawns, but you're stuck. Just, just exactly what to do to make any sort of progress in this position. It looks like two pawns down. Maybe, maybe Anan has built a fortress. He says, go ahead, you got your extra two pawns, but what do you do with them? A really fascinating position, guys. If Anand has seen this deeply, which it seems he has, he may actually be saving this game. We have Rook C6 on the board, Geary up the two pawns and not moving. So he's aware of the challenge that's about to be ahead of him. I don't know what you guys think, but it does look as though this genius world champion, former world champ, five-time champ, has figured out an amazing position down two pawns and still maybe making a draw. Wow. Very rare to see an advantage of two pawns being so little. I mean, just uh, re remarkable. And let's go back to our game, Christian, of the round. Well, as Jasper, got just for a second, second. Yes, please. Just for a second, maybe we can look on your board and analyze this end game. I did uh, sprinkle an idea in my mind at some point. The uh, one Vichy, between Vichy, Vichy and, and Anish. Anish, the one that Maurice was just M talking about. With the king coming to d8 and, yes. the, and the rook uh, coming across let's to e6. Let's sit on your board, e e6. I do not want to allow you to get your rook to e6. Okay. Let me see if I have a way to do that. So, for example, what I do want is to go rook to d7 first. Rook to d7 first. Yes. Rook to d7. So, your ID intention is that after king... King to e6. Yes. Rook to g7. Yes. King to f6. Correct. Now I go d7. Rook to d6. And now I go rook h7. Right. And now you don't have rook e6 to stop my king. And Maurice will say, big, hairy deal. Uh, the rook still cuts the king. That's the problem. <laughs> the, the rook still cuts yeah, the, king. the king. Isn't that remarkable? It's remarkable, yes. Uh, wonderful. Uh, but jump. And quickly, Christian, we, what's we gotta, happening we, we gotta go the, to the uh, Korobo. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. We, we have to go to the Korobo for oh, the please. moment because this one is just exploding. And I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> so, queen takes e4, king to b2, b3. Now, of course, you can take any other approach. You can uh, keep the, this rook on the board, go rook to c8, do not exchange, and then try to focus. Once again, the big focus is the pawn on f6. You have to get a rook on the sixth rank and try to take that pawn on f6. Instead of that, he played this move b3, and now we have the move knight to c3 on the board. My assumption is that after a takes b3, his plan was to go rook to b8. I'm looking at this position, and I'm seeing ideas of queen takes b8. And I'm trying to understand whether they work or not, but they do not work, because you're not forced to take with the rook, and then rook to d8 would win for white. Instead of that, you can make something along the lines of bishop takes f6. Not only that you're giving a check, but also you're covering this d8 square mm -hmm. with the bishop. So for example, if you go e5, guess what? Now I can actually take on b8. You do not have rook to d8 because that bishop on f6 is guarding, and you're just simply running out of time to defend the king. This is what was going to happen if he was going to accept that pawn on b3. He decided to go knight to c3, covering up the king. Uh, knight around the king in this type of dangerous situations is probably the best defender you want to have around your king. So he has one knight over there. Okay, let's bring another knight uh, next to the king. Knight g a2. This is the position we currently have on the board. What I'm seeing also with this move knight g2, not only that you're connecting the knights towards the defense, but also, for example, if black is going to find a way to attack the pawn on um, f6, Six. e5 is going to work. Uh, because the queen on f4 with the knight on e2 right now is protected. So right now, to be honest, I have a feeling unless something immediate happens, drastic, yeah, then maybe white is starting to get back into the game. Unraveling, yeah. Ch rook check. I'm expecting check. king a1 and hide, 
Hide uh, as fast as possible. Yeah, any attacks of the night, rook b3 could be met by rook h3, for example. That's a Donnybrook, but I want to turn our attention back to the game of MVL and Nepo because this is an, an amazing opportunity, I think, for our tournament leader. Uh, we've just seen the move rook c7 by um, MVL, and it looks optically like this pawn is about to be captured until you see the move bishop d8. Once you see the move bishop d8, you go, aha, uh -huh, I understand what you're saying. Rook takes c6, where is your rook going? It looks like you've got something, but no. There's bishop d7, you've trapped the rook. Yes, you could uh, bail out with bishop e5, but at the end of the day, you've got bishop takes, and these two connected pass pawn will decide the game. It looks like, to my eyes, bishop d8 is, and it's all Nepo. Back to Zagreb and Maurice. Well, a crazy position also happening. Why would we be surprised that all of them are crazy this round? We saw 10 draws, and now we're seeing maybe no draws happen, depending on how these games result. At least they're wild ones. In this position between Saric and Grishchuk, we saw knight e3, rook f8, knight to d5, and finally the minors have been exchanged off. Rook takes d5, queen to c4. This is a pawn sacrifice, pawn sacrifice by Saric. King to d8, h4. He's just saying, I got compensation? He didn't have to give away this pawn, but he's just going for comp alone. Queen e2, queen d6, and rook to e3. Saying, I've got enough. H5 could happen. I could take on E5. No problem there. Rook to D2 by Grishchuk and attacking the queen. How many times have we seen these trebling on the files by the major pieces? White has done it twice. Black now has it on the D file as well. Queen G4 is going to be an H5. Then E5 is hanging. Uh, Rook F8 is possible right now. This is a wild one, and we're coming down to time pressure as well. No surprise there. Grishuk with 2.12 on the clock to Ivan Saric's 6.15. Absolutely crazy chess going on in this game. There, we don't know what's going to happen, folks, on any of the boards, it seems, at the moment. I don't think we've come down to any round where we don't know what's going to happen on any board this late in the games. Usually at least two games have been drawn, but all five still in play this late into the day. Exciting stuff. Definitely breaking out here in Zagreb. Absolutely. Thank you, Maurice. Yeah, I. what a round. I, I, I am truly befuddled. I mean, uh, normally I feel like I have some understanding of what's going on. One game I do think I, I understand. I think White's winning <laughs> uh, in this game because the pawn on F6 is exactly. you're, you're holding it. You're getting to play Rook D6, and as you mentioned, E5. If you if that bishop on H8 remains buried, that it's is, game over. That was the problem, Yasser, and this was the consequence of this move, Knight G E2, that Korobov simply didn't pick up upon, and that is the fact that I have this move E5 available for mm -hmm. uh, White, and now the pawn on F6 is is untouchable the pawn on e5 for the moment is untouchable you cannot take it even if you do something along the lines of this this Whoops. and taking on e5 because wait no more guardians on the eighth rank that king is going to get checkmated it seems like anton in his quest to find his mona lisa he lost his mind and he lost, he lost the position as well and what about uh, nepo how is that uh, oh we do have oh. <laughs> Do we have a repetition? Just when I think I understand something, we did, Nepo did play the move bishop d8. I thought that was a really great tactical opportunity, but MVL looked further. He said, "Yeah, you 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 trap my rook, but I've got I've got I've got pawns and it's you don't see this every day. Two bishops versus a rook and two pawns, but white has no pawns at all." I think it's just uh, going to peter out into a draw. This one, king to f5 or king to g5, bishop to e7 is most likely going to come on the board. Why would it peter out to a draw? You think black has any chances? Well, I thought he was going to play something like rook d8 and to try to... I mean, if I could, in this exact moment, play the move h4, yeah, I would say uh, chances for black. The problem is he's not going to get in h5, h4 once this bishop has... Uh, achieved e7 patrolling that diagonal 
Absolutely, and it seems like uh, okay, we're draw. going to see a draw very soon. Oof. Let's stick with this one. Let's just finish this one. Uh, I have times a on the clock, please. Uh, Nine minutes Chris? for MVL and Plum. two minutes for uh, Nepo, but I don't think there's any complications left on the board. Exactly. In that case, let's jump to Maurice in Zagreb. Maurice. Big result, potential result. Well, let's not call it that. Let's just say the situation is tense again with Saric versus Grishuk. Just wanted to point out, Saric has five minutes and 15 seconds. Grishuk has 22 seconds. No surprise there. He's up the pawn. He's kept the E5 pawn, but it shouldn't be enough, it seems, to make it an easy win for him because we know these major piece endings are very difficult to make any progress. His extra pawn, this past, uh, this pawn on E5 is not passed. It is firmly stopped, in fact, not going to ever get to the E4 square. And it's hard for him to make any hay with his 3-2 to two on the other side of the board as well. Will his time pressure be a factor here? Grishchuk usually plays like a genius in time pressure. Sharish does not want to win. Gary Kasparov is somewhere <laughs> biting his fingernails. <laughs> Come on, don't lose this game. Keep this score so I can jump in and have a chance to catch Nepo or MVL. Depends on what happened. Looks like it should be a draw that game. You can stay right within range and just be a point behind Nepo. So don't lose the game. Very exciting game afoot right here. We'll, be, we'll see what happens in the next few moves. Thank you, Maurice. And what do you have for us, uh, Christian? I just want to focus on uh, the ending of uh, those couple of games that are reaching the point. This one is specifically with MVL. MVL uh, versus Nepo. This was the critical matchup of uh, our round. We're expecting Bishop to d6 check. King, King F to f3. King to f3. And then you don't want to see this rook somehow landing. How am I going to get to h1? Well, not... probably bishop e6 now, and bishop d5 is going to come on the board. Bishop e6, yes. And back to Maurice quickly. Maurice? Big result about to happen. Geary has broken through because Anna made a terrible mistake here. g4 is only chance. It's like, oh, you're hoping. Let's see if we can get through. And here, he could maintain the position. Just don't do anything. Play a move like rook to c4, for example. Instead, he took on g4, and after takes, here he has to play with checks against the king, rook c2. Instead, he played rook c4 and allowed g takes and takes and king e3, and all of a sudden, it's just a sweet past f pawn that's gonna race down the board and disrupt everything. Suddenly, white is winning the game Anand is going to go down. Geary about to get the full point. What a mistake by Anand after playing such a fine tournament so far. Woo. Uh, ooh. Big, big slip indeed. Just at the very last round of uh, the rabbit. And we do have a handshake in the game between Nepo and VL. Uh, an extraordinary game. Just it, it we was do have so a, full of content. We do have another handshake, Yasser, in About? the game between Duda and Korobov. It happened. Duda just won the game. Duda has just won the game because because well, uh, it was a piece up and uh, there's a lot of pieces up. Yes, yeah, I see that now. A uh, lot of pieces and maybe we can see that position on uh, the live board if there, the players are still there discussing the game. No. They left. Yes. So when we left it, it was just that we've seen this uh, king a1, e5, and uh, white was simply taking over. And after trades, takes, takes two extra pieces, well, two knights. And this is where Anton threw in the towel. I have to in, say, I do not feel like justice was served in this game. <laughs> it was such a beautiful <laughs> no, game. No, it, it, everything was... Uh, was the table was set yes and there was a slip there was a slip huge slip. And, and he knows it i mean i'm sure he knows it he knows that he could have played slowly in that position instead of going uh, ballistic with d5 he could have just retreated the knight 97 open up the bishop and then just play slowly mm -hmm. and take an advantage back home on the dark squares and that's exactly what the position was requiring in uh, that moment he went d5 
looking for his Mona Lisa, as you were mentioning, yeah, yeah. Yasser, he did not find her. Exactly, he let it slip away. Uh, and again, it's crazy double-edged game where I think all three results are possible. Let's go um, to the Van Forest game. Yeah, the Jordan Van Forest, we've just seen this big time move by Jordan Knight to D6. He's looking to play E7, make a queen. At the same time, Rook check, E2, and Rook F1 is on Shaq's agenda. Three results are possible again in this game. Absolutely, and we see this move G4, fending H4. off H4, sorry, fending off the Rook G5 idea. I see that. Wow. And Stopping Rook G5, we but have only Rook tempo. E5. And by the way, we do we, we do have a result. Anish Giri has defeated the five-time world champion, and Anish, uh, a big result for him. But Vichy is, oh, gosh, uh, spoiled uh, what up to this moment had been a fantastic game. What's happening here is my pick, Shaq, winning? I'm, uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's I, like, ah. Uh, how about Jordan is winning? I, I, I don't know. Uh, rook to e4, it does look like the rooks are quite powerful, especially well, against the I'm, king. Yeah, and I'm thinking that e2 is, I love the fact that the rook is behind the yeah. pass pawn and supporting the, the, his own pass pawn. If Jordan has, has been forced to play the move h4, I'm going to say something went wrong. Rook to d7, he's looking for his own checkmate. <laughs> wow. 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 As well as a discovered a check, either knight g5 or And now e2? What knight if I just go e2? That um, king is uh, primed on dark square to get checked with e1 queen, with a promotion. Whoa, you're absolutely right. e2 coming with e1 check, you would have thought uh, that was the way to go. He played rook check King to f3. Though. King f3, then... Why did I play rook check? I'm I do not, not sure. Know. I am not sure either. I mean, you would have thought e2 in order to... It felt like that was winning the, the game. It sure did. Unless um, we missed something, and I'm sure we probably did, to be honest. I mean, there's okay, so many... Okay, king f6, well, we've got a handshake. Oh, my goodness. The, we do... I, we think it's a draw. Is I have it? to just see how the kings are placed in the middle of the board. Yes, uh, draw Ivan Saric. Congratulations to Ivan having a plus score against this field, coming in as the low, one of the lowest rated player alongside uh, Jordan Van Forest. Uh, hats off, just great result. Uh, what's going on in this game between uh, Jordan and let's, Shaq? Let's stay with this one. Um, Whoa. Rook to f7, king to g5. That pawn is on e2 right now. Yes, and he's just played. And the pawn is promoting. <laughs> Shaq is like hesitating to promote the pawn. Like why? <laughs> but now I, you hesitate. I do feel like uh, White has enough compensation. Uh, no. No? There, no. There's a bishop on b3, yeah, sir. I understand. But that bishop is going to go to d5. You cannot uh, re uh, take it away from that diagonal. And I'm going to go e7 next. Isn't that enough? No. Queen to b4. Can't, it can't be enough. Can't be. Just can't be. So, uh, I would be shocked. What about a4? a4, bishop d5. And queen takes b2 and check. And d6. And, and I'm getting close. <gasps> and he's going for it, but... King You're to right. D6. He's going king to d6. I don't know. I'm starting to like uh, white's situation. Of course, you still have queen to b4. Queen but I'm not going to go king to d7. I'm going to go king to c6. I need to stay close to my bishop. Queen a3 check, king to c6. Queen to h2, Whoa. wow. And now Man, my, <laughs> every time I, I, I think I understand what's going on, I see a move like queen h2 and I say, what? King to c6 on the board and b4? Is that his intent? Yes, he's reaching for the pawn, as you can tell. He's going to play b4, e7, queen back to e5. We do have b4 on the board. Let me just put that on the board. I'm anticipating e7, queen back to e5. And you've got ideas of b3 and ab3, a3. 
But then I will go uh, rook takes h7. I need to get rid of that pawn. By the way, very important pass pawn, very right? Important. I mean, I would dream of throwing in a move like h5. Uh, that would be a very dangerous pawn. So you're saying e7, queen e5, rook h7 feels like the right way to go. Let's wait and see what. What is Jordan the time of do. the players? Is Jordan has 32 seconds and Shaq 32 seconds. And as you can see for Shaq, this is a really important game. A victory for Shaq would propel him forwards and whoa, rook, to rook a, a seven. seven. You always you. No, it's but like you take your your heart in your hands when you you because the rook is not protected. And there is even a move like queen b8. Queen b8, it seems like the right move. You cannot yeah. take that pawn on a4. You would have to go. Queen e8, check. You have to go e7. And here he's reaching for his queen, and he's found it. You have to and go e7. And that move, did you see? It was almost an electric shock that went through uh, Jordan's body there. That move, queen b8, was missed. And he has to rethink his strategy. Does Jordan, and he's played check. Uh, pardon me, uh, not check, he's no, attacked. Queen to queen. e8. Queen e8. And get check. that h-pawn going. Oh, Whoa. what just <laughs> happened? <laughs> queen a8, and well, what it, what Shaq is thinking about is b3. b3, let's go. b3 takes a3. Time for another no, but queen. Bishop f7 is also a move that you have to uh, Respect. take into account. Yes, I do indeed. Bishop f7, king e7. Whoa, uh, the, the, oh, it's all about the clock, right? My Take goodness. on A2. Take on What's A2. What's happening? Rook to B5. Whoa, and look, there's a king on G5. What a move. What a move. This is the money move, Yasser. White is winning, I think. No, 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 no not so fast, not so fast. I believe Queen, White is winning. Queen to A7, Queen Bishop A7. B7. I understand, King Check. H6. Oh, you can queen. I'm queening, and I'm going to give but the checkmate. But I'm queening. And I, I think I will give the checkmate with the rook and king to h6. Wait, He's let's done see. it. So Jordan's got e... Well, he has no choice. He can't stop the pawn, so you might as well queen. But if you queen, queen d4. My I goodness, this is... Queen d4 check, and then I queen. And then I queen. But do I have enough queens to cover all the checks? <laughs> do I don't I? think I have enough queens to cover the checks. Hold the on. Answer. <laughs> That's going to go viral. Do I have enough queens to cover the check? <laughs> Two queens is you, not enough. You, you heard it here. Oh, no, he didn't, he queen didn't throw in the queen, queen, queen d4 isn't that check. check. Ah, queen f8, queen g7 is counter check. Correct. Queen f8 check. Queen g7 counter check. Oh, no, this cannot be. Oh, this be is good. unbelievable. What the heck is going on? He played queen to e6. Now it's black who's going to give Now the it's checks. black. But I think black has enough queens. Right now, black <laughs> definitely has enough queens. Black has enough queens. Okay. What a game. What We've a got game. to establish the facts. Black has enough queens. And was queen g7, right? That, queen g7, king That just to g6. felt wrong. This is the right way to finish this day, Yasser. Oh, uh, bef uh, what a what a round! I mean, I just I, the results might not be there, but the fighting spirit has been <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary. Now, come on, Shaq. Shaq needs to find a way to exchange one pair of queens. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to quote you for a long time. <laughs> Black needs to find a way to exchange. Uh, how many queens do we need? Uh, Jordan's not going down. What a spirited fight. This is fantastic, folks. We're really And I think enjoying. now after queen to g7, ah. queen to h8, queen oh, to g7, yes. queen to oh, f6. Yes. I think this is the maneuver we're the, going to see right oh, now. Also, we do have queen to e5 at this specific moment as well. That finishes that the game. should finish the game. And Shaq says, let me take a pair of queens off the board. And that was it. Wow. 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 Poor Jordan, a a very, very unlucky. Uh, that was extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm still uh, in shock by what we just saw. That was just a fantastic, fantastic round. Very, very awkward for us to call. Uh, just too many things going on. It was just 
too imbalanced. I and need to catch this my breath last, off their death Yeah, line, yes, this last round, Jordan Queen first, and our first impression was White was winning. And but the two queen, queens were covering absolutely every single check. It was amazing, and this was the whole point. I think where we got we thought excited this for Jordan yes. was that we saw this check, and then after Queen, we were expecting Queen F4 and some kind of a mating pattern for White, forgetting the fact that Queen G7 interposes with check. Wow. Wow, what an extraordinary finish to an extraordinary round. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to catch up. We'll have your standings. We'll have some interviews. Uh, we need to catch our breath. No, absolutely. What an amazing way to finish the rapid. And let's look at the replay of the finish of this game. Yeah, because it was such a topsy-turvy moment. And for the players, too, I think their hearts were pounding. Guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> loudly. I remember at one event, the idea was to put a heart monitor on the players so that the spectators could see how the players were reacting. If they had put heart monitors on these guys. <laughs> and look how disappointed that press of the clock was when he played Queen E6, he realized yeah. he doesn't have a check to give. Exactly. Simply doesn't have a check because Queen E6 is basically a resignation at this point. Exactly. You know the queens are going to find a way to connect and bring that queen trade on the board. Right. And this was very, very well played by Shaq. Queen C3 check and then bringing the queen on A7 into the game with tempo as we saw. Uh, and the times at this exact moment, the players were playing on increment, weren't they? Absolutely. Uh, there were about 10 seconds each, dropping down to their last five seconds occasionally. Quite an, what an amazing game. But let's go to Zagreb and get some interviews with Maurice Ashley. First interview we have is with Anish Giri breaking through with a big win this round. Anish, the tournament hadn't gone your way. There were some opportunities for you, but you finally broke through in the last round. Yeah, I have a feeling, you know, like the worse I play, the luckier I get. Sometimes I play quite well and then I get really unlucky. And uh, whenever I play horrible, I get really lucky. So, yeah, let's, I don't know what to conclude basically, but let's just keep on going. You got a lot of blitz games ahead. Do you feel like you're in form now for the quick games? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I don't really understand. Like, sometimes I feel I'm in good form and then I score badly, and sometimes it's obvious I'm playing quite poor, but then the results are, are good. So I don't not think about my form much, uh, but I'm happy with the win. I think I'm uh, in a decent position now, and I'm looking forward to the blitz. In general, I'm just looking forward here to play a little bit of chess. To be honest, not putting much uh, emphasis on the results um, and just trying to, trying to enjoy, you know, playing quick chess over the board. I didn't have that experience in a long time. I've played classical chess over the board, but I played uh, Rapid and Blitz only online. And, you know, there is some charm and fun in this, you know, pieces flying a little bit, clocks being hit. Uh, I just wanted to you know, experience that again. And uh, maybe it could be useful for the upcoming World Cup. All right. Well, good luck uh, in the next two, rounds, two, two days. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, Maurice, and congratulations, our congratulations to um, Anish for a very important victory. There you see the players being interviewed and the stage of this really, really magnificent tournament uh, in Croatia. Our thanks to the organizers for putting on such an extraordinary show. I'm in shock, Christian. I, th that last round, was one of the most amazing uh, rounds with this Anton Korobov game, this uh, Vichy game, with two pawns down, but a fortress. It, you could feel everything. You everything. could feel the energy brewing in those first two rounds. Yeah. The players were making draws, but those were contested, very combative exactly. draws, each and every one of them. Right. We didn't have a single boring draw. And then in the final round, it just all exploded. Exactly. That same ish on the board. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, that was just an incredible <laughs> game. If Korobov would have won that one, potentially Oof. the game of uh, the tournament so far. No question about it. Let's take a look at our standings as we've completed the rapid chess portion of our event. And we have such we got? a contested tournament so far. Jan Nepomnia, she grabbed the lead in the first round and caught and kept it all the way through 
to the last round of the rapid event. He started with two wins, as he you were He started saying. with two wins. He has 11 points right now in the leadership position. But Closely behind, second, we have group. tied for the second. How many players? Four players. Four Maxi players. Vashir Lagrav, Anish Giri, Kasparov right now, who is suiting up for tomorrow. And Duda. And Duda. Well, let's go back to uh, Maurice in Zagreb with Shakman Midarov and get his thoughts on a stupendous round. Just incredible. Very exciting game to be sure, Shakriar. This is not a kind of game you play every day. It must have been incredible pleasure, but also anxiety playing out this game. Okay, really very nice game. Uh, I think there are many mistakes, but it's normal uh, when it's time problems. But uh, not every day we see three queens. Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely good, very nice. I think uh, we both played very interesting. Maybe uh, I missed somewhere some chance to win easily. But normally, uh, I think uh, it's a very important moment when I'm not playing rook h5 move. It's one when he, uh, we check, maybe I can show, I don't know, maybe. Oh, very quickly? Yeah, which, yeah, which moment yeah, is rook, I mean, here is uh, when uh, check and king h2 is normally is we rook h5 and rook take h4 is made in two move. But I miss rook h5 and after I play move and after immediately I see I miss mate in two. Of course, it's okay. Very interesting game. Just you weren't playing so well before. Uh, you're at this point now. You did win in Bucharest. Yeah. What is your ambition for this tournament? Uh, as you know that Wesley has already won in Paris and has a, a very nice lead on, on the tour right now. Okay, last two years, last three years, I play very bad uh, rapid and blitz tournaments. Normally, uh, my rating going down in, in after every tournament. Uh, I don't know, maybe now I am old man <laughs> because I cannot play very fast. But uh, my ambitions in rapid and also in blitz, I, I want to just play uh, normal. I mean, I, I am sure uh, not easy for me to play very good, but now uh, I prefer to play classical chess. Uh, but Okay, now I hope we will continue play good, interesting chess. And for this tournament, I just try to play good chess. Old and strong is what I will say. Yeah. Good luck yes. in the rest of your games. Thank you very much. Maurice, let Shaq know that uh, he's the horse I picked, so he's got to make me look yes. good. Absolutely. <laughs> Maurice is probably gearing up for another An interview. interview, but man, what a day we had. And uh, I cannot wait for uh, the blitz uh, portion. Yes, I know. I've got the jitters. Just got to get rid of this round because uh, it, it was so awkward. Uh, I'm teasing you and I'm saying, what's going on? What's going on? Because I don't know what's going on. You were like, I don't know either. Stop asking me these questions, especially that game with Anton. That just really... You know, you win a game like that, and it just propels you forward for the blitz. You lose a game like that, and you're just like, oh, man, you know, you're not ready for the blitz. We've got 18 rounds of blitz coming, nine tomorrow on Saturday, nine on Sunday, and, of course, Gary Kasparov is suited up. And I mean, and this I is our day tomorrow and Sunday. July 10th, we have day four with the first nine rounds of Blitz. Then July 11th, that's when we crown the victor. In the final day, we have another nine rounds, rounds 10 through the 18th. And if playoffs are needed, then we're going to play some more chess. Yeah, and these Blitz games with Gary. Gary is going to sit there and say, Ivan Saric, you the man. I mean, uh, come on, he comes in uh, representing Croatia and Right now, he's with Maurice, so let's go to the man, Ivan Saric. Well, indeed, Croatian superstar Ivan Saric, all smiles. You've got to be satisfied with this result you had in this tournament. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, finally, finally, the tournament is over, and I'm quite happy. Uh, the last game was a bit uh, shaky, though. I, I had everything under control, and then. Uh, I started to play really bad, and uh, I missed some tactical nuance, and then I just uh, was pawned down, and uh, it looked like it will be uh, a tough, tough uh, endgame to defend. 
but uh, luckily he he repeated the position three times, which he didn't realize at the first, and uh, I claimed the three fold the repetition, and uh, the game ended in a draw. Got to know the rules. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you sure you want to let Gary in here, or do you want to keep playing? <laughs> Well, I'm not that good in blitz. Uh, I prefer prefer rapid. I think uh, it even suits me better than the classical one, because I tend to play uh, fast in classical time control, and this is uh, perfect with the difference that my opponents don't have time, and I'm practically playing almost the same level. So for me, rapid is an ideal uh, form of chess. And in blitz, I'm not uh, not that. Uh, Good, yeah, I, I don't know. For me, Blitz is a bit uh, luck. And against those players, uh, players of that strength, uh, you are often uh, unlucky. Indeed. Headed to the World Cup, you feel this was good confidence, a confidence booster? Yes, of course. I didn't expect such a result. I mean, I was hoping for it, but uh, in the end, uh, I lost only one game. Uh, also, I shouldn't, I should have. I shouldn't have lost that game, so against such opposition, this is an amazing result, and I'm very confident uh, about my chances in the World Cup. But uh, World Cup is completely different uh, competition. The knockout system is uh, something else. It's uh, it's quite uh, stressful for the players, and uh, you you got to choose uh, different uh, strategies and different approach for each game. So that's something completely different. Well, if you played anything like you did here. I'm sure they're the ones who are going to be stressed. That is your opponents. Congratulations on a fantastic result and good luck in the World Cup. Thank you very much. Guys. Thank you, Maurice. And again, congratulations to Ivan Sarovic. What's an interesting uh, question is in the Blitz, ages. Uh, is Blitz chess a young man's game or is it tailor made for experience? What's your thoughts, uh, Christian? I do believe it is a young man's game. Nevertheless, experience matters so much in Blitz. And uh, the older you get, the more experience you, you have. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a very interesting mix, and we're going to have to wait and see what's happening tomorrow. But as you can see, the ages of these players, Jordan Van Forest, 22 years of age, and Jan Christoph Duda, who is just having a resurgence right now in the tournament, Anish Giri, 27. And at the bottom of the table, we see Vishvanath Ananan and Gary Kasparov bringing the energy and the experience. Yeah, when I look at this field and say, okay, it's only, only Blitz, then I'm looking at MVL and Nepo as maybe the Blitz specialist I would put some loose change on. I mean, Gary, because Gary, Vichy, these are the X factors. Something crazy could happen. They could have a little bit of the magic that propelled them to many World Chess Championships. I do believe that Nepo uh, right now is the man. I mean, he's played great in the Rapids. And <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of the man, we have Maurice in Zagreb with Jan Nepomniachtchi. Maurice. Indeed, the leader after the Rapid, the victor for the Rapids. Anyway, Jan Nepomniachtchi, the world champion challenger. Jan, it was a day of uh, some draws, some fighting chess. Were you satisfied with your play? Uh, well, yeah, you know, yes and no, uh, both, because uh, in general I think I played better than yesterday, because yesterday ended on some, you know, spectacular game, probably the worst game I can recall, uh, you know, which I played with White in any years, I think, so it could be a little bit the same against Anton in the, in the round one, but at least it, it, it would be like fighting and there were like few ideas uh, beside, I mean, be, you know, behind my play. But in this game against uh, Ivan, I mean, okay, it's, it's not even funny. Like once I blunder it, I cannot recapture with a piece on d5. Uh, I can't say I give up on my game, but in general, it was very, very hard to fight back. So I'm just, I think, okay, I can maybe I can make a draw after some big torture, but I mean, anyway, you shouldn't let something like this happen. Uh, so today, uh, objectively, it was like more, you know, I'm more intelligent from my side, but uh, still, uh, I mean, were some, there were some, there were some uh, up and downs, like against Maxim. I think at some point I was losing uh, after some imprecise move, like King E7, 95 was very strong, and then okay, of course I was winning, and okay, everything ended up in a draw. So, not you know, not that bad, but also you know, 
could be better, as, as usual. You don't really have any stake in this tournament. It's not like you're getting grand chess tour points. But it's clear, as a competitor, you still want to win. So your thoughts about the next two days coming up? Well, once, it go, once it's going well, more or less fine, yeah, I have some very, very huge point handicap, like uh, one point uh, and like uh, 18 rounds to go. So, <laughs> I mean, of, of, of course, I'm kidding. Well, uh, we'll I think let's just, see, let's just see what happens, but uh, I think uh, Blitz would be a little bit more, you know, more easy to play, you know, less pressure, less, prepar less preparation, you know, more fun. But uh, you never know, let's say, how your day will go in Blitz, so it could be e you know, either devastating or, on the contrary, like very, very good. So. Well, I'm not going to put any extra pressure on you, but I picked you to win the event, so uh, I, got, I need bragging uh -huh. rights. Against those guys in the studio, so you know. You why did you? Why did you tell me this? Already? Now, <laughs> now it's yeah. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good luck in your next two days. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. If you could ask uh, Nepo the question, how does he rate himself in the world of blitz players? Where does he see it for himself? Oh, I, I think the we lost Nepo, unfortunately. Oh boy. He needs to uh, regain that energy for the blitz uh, yeah. portion, of course. Well, I think we. Well, first of all, let's see how Nepo became our tournament leader, and he maintained it. He started with those two big victories, Christian. Two big victories in the first two rounds, then he finished the first uh, day with a draw. Then he started off blazing hot in the second day with another victory, drew the fifth round, lost the sixth round, and this is the uh, uh, game that he was mentioning that it's probably one of his worst games as white in recent years. But against in, Ivan Saric. Against Ivan Saric the Croatian local hero, and then in day three, he three finished plus. on a peaceful note. He had some chances against MVL, but with the black pieces against MVL, it's never an easy game, and I think he was quite content with his final result. A very topsy-turvy uh, final game, as again, uh, we'll take a look at our standings. He is nursing a one-point lead against a pack of wolves. Uh, let's put it that way, nipping at his heels by one point, Christian. That is Maxim Vashir Lagrav, Anish Giri, Kasparov, who we're going to start seeing tomorrow, Jan Kristoff Duda, who just won an incredible game against Anton Korobov. We have Shakri Armamediarov, Vishwanathan Anand, Alexander, oh, Vishwanathan Anand on nine points. Then we have Alexander Grishuk with eight points, Anton Korobov with seven points, and Jordan Van Forest with six points who is surely disappointed after that wild game. But let's go to Zagreb and Maurice with his final thoughts. Maurice. Well, what a final round we had there. That's the greatness of chess. You can have two rounds where you go, I don't know what just happened, and then something explosive like what we saw in the last round. You're like, this is why we love this game. As much as I picked Nepo to win the event, the, the scores are so bunched up right now. Five players uh, within the lead or a point of the lead. I got to say, it seems to me like the winner of the Blitz wins the tournament. I mean, it doesn't seem like that hard a concept to understand, despite the fact that Nepo was a one-point lead. He better not let anybody else catch fire because they're going to catch and probably overtake him. So it's all going to come down to this these last two days. And who's coming in and who feels like he has a fighting chance? One Gary Kasparov, the champ is here. He enters the building, the legend himself. This is going to be as exciting as it gets as a finale. I can't wait. And we'll be here to call all the action live from Zagreb. Thank you, Maurice. I tell you, I feel like I need to recover, uh, bring full strength tomorrow for the Blitz and for Gary Kasparov. From all of us here in studio in St. Louis and from Zagreb, thank you so much for sharing your day with us. Be sure to join us tomorrow and Sunday. Christian, see you it tomorrow. It was a great pleasure indeed. See you all tomorrow. See you tomorrow.